So this means that our sorry, we're live. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Great Salt Lake Institute and Op, Op Planetarium watch party for the Mars rover landing. <laughs> Who's excited? Did anybody bring their diapers in case yeah. you have to pee? <laughs> That's right. You're not allowed to leave. <laughs> I, I know I've heard that there's um, some schools that are coming in and watching us, entire classes. I know there's a sixth grade class and there's gonna be fifth grade classes later. Um, so if, as our audience is coming in, if you want us to call out your school, let us know who you are in the comments. While you're coming in, um, I just want to remind everybody we have two ways of connecting with our scientists. Actually, we have lots of ways of connecting with our scientists. If you're here um, on the Zoom uh, webinar, there is a chat function at the bottom and there's also a Q&A section at the bottom. We're going to try to monitor all of them, but if you have a question, we would love for you to ask us questions live and we have all of these really awesome scientists that can can answer your questions, put it in the Q&A uh, box. Um, I know I heard that Westminster College is here. Go Griffins, Westminster College. Except we want to change our mascot to the fighting brine shrimp, but that's good. Yeah, I'm working on that. <laughs> I know Portland State University is here. Oh, Bonnie, your students are starting to come in. I see the woo, woo. students. <laughs> <laughs> go students, go students. Bonnie Baxter fan club. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. That's what they told John <laughs> this week that they were. I appreciate that. They've never said that to me, John. So I appreciate they said that to you. <laughs> they live in terror of me. I'm sure. Yeah, that's exactly what I think of. <laughs> oh my goodness. While people, while people are coming in, um, John, you had asked uh, Dr. Scott Pearl a question that I would love for everybody to hear. Could you could you repeat your question? Dave? Sure, I was I was asking. Scott's worked on the Curiosity uh, mission, which is the last rover mission, and I asked him what it was like to work on a Mars work schedule where you're working on a 24 hour and 40 minute schedule as opposed to a 24 hour schedule. So, Scott, what was that like? Yeah. So. Uh, so when it came down to essentially living life by a spreadsheet, um, the, the fact that you have two planets that are at a different rotations in terms of, of, of their speed as well as the different lengths of a day, um, you're essentially at the mercy of that spreadsheet. And so you can have days that start essentially at 1 or 2 in the morning and end at, at about 9 or 10 that same day or, or, or essentially starting in the afternoon and then going on to late in the evening and, and in terms of odd hours in the morning. So... Um, it's something where once you're on it, you have to essentially stay on it until you're done um, because it's very difficult to, to kind of go from that schedule to a normal nine to five, which is rare in general. But uh, yeah, it was, it was very interesting to do it both for Mer as well as MSL. So how was how long was that? Like, I mean, how so did everybody do 90 days and then somebody else came in or what? How long was that? Yeah, so, so the reason why we do that is because we're going essentially um, in terms of what the nine to five, quote unquote, is for Mars. And so the Martian day, the start of the Martian day, whenever that is for Earth, is our, is our start. And so when it comes down to actually making full use of that Martian day uh, when we first go on, um, we want to make sure that we're up as kind of bright and early in terms of Gale Crater, in terms of Radiani Planum. Uh, and so... Um, uh, yeah, so once we're done in terms of the actual 90 days, uh, 
the the team kind of goes off into its normal earth time and then we're able to uh uh to phase into that kind of schedule it takes time though that's yeah and i i guess with Murr, you had a 90-day mission that went for 15 years so mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all all good things <laughs> So do we have a, a pretty large crew here already, Jamie, or how are we looking? We can't hear you. I'm actually not sure because I'm sharing my screen. With oh, me. right. Okay. Um, the last check that I had, we had um, over 100 people. That okay. Were... I know Garfield School is here now. I saw Garfield School come in. Well, before you, um, before we kind of go over to see what NASA is doing, should we just go around and introduce ourselves so that everybody hey, yeah. knows who's here and then we can maybe watch a little NASA TV for a while, see what's going on there? Yeah, that's great. So who'd like to start? You start, John. Oh, all right. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. My name is John Armstrong. I'm a physics professor at Weber State University, and I'm the director of the Op Planetarium. Uh, my uh, scientific research lately has been focused on studying exoplanets, but when I was a graduate student and a postdoc, I worked on uh, Mars uh, exploration. And in fact, um, we were doing a lot of analysis of the Viking landers uh, because that was prior to the Mars exploration rover landing. Uh, and the funny story I like to tell about that is my advisor, Conway Leovi, who was a meteorologist, wanted to put a weather station on the Mars Exploration Rover. And they said, no, don't bother because it's only a 90 day mission. And as I alluded to uh, Scott just <laughs> the other <laughs> second, it was a 15 year mission and boy, it would have been nice to have 15 years of weather data. Um, but there you go, that's the, way it, that's the way it goes sometimes. So that's my connection here. And, uh, and we'll see who would like to introduce themselves next. I'll go next. Um, I'm Bonnie Baxter. I'm a professor of biology at Westminster College, and I direct Great Salt Lake Institute. And you may wonder what Great Salt Lake has to do with Mars. Um, and my colleague, Scott Pearl from NASA, uh, JPL, is also on here, and he can say, he can elaborate on this a bit. Um, but Scott got really interested in Great Salt Lake because it um, is a a lake system that has evaporites. In other words, it has salts where water has previously evaporated. And that is similar to what a closed basin lake system um, might have looked like on Mars as the water started evaporating from the surface. We think the water would have gotten saltier and saltier. And so if there was life in that water, it would have been very salty life at the end. It would have evolved to live in that high salt um, conditions. And we know that these types of microbes and their molecules can survive in salt over geologic time. So um, we're super excited to bring Great Salt Lake to the party and um, uh, let, let Mars know that Great Salt Lake is happy to serve as an analogous system on our planet. I'll go next. Uh, okay. my, name is, my name is Jamie Butler. I run Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster College. And um, I am just lucky enough that I get to hang out with all of these space nerds because really I'm a wildlife biologist. I really love um, bugs and brine shrimp, which brine shrimp have gone to Mars, which I think is really very cool. Not um, Mars, space, right? I space, mean, sorry, Mars. Space, space, not space. Mars. I have Mars on my brain. I'm sorry, they've gone to space. <laughs> Next, next thing, Brian Shrimp to Mars. Um, yeah, so really I'm here um, just being lucky to be along the ride on this ride and I'm gonna be kind of doing our technology and making sure that we stay online and asking questions. I do have a question for Professor Armstrong though that came from the chat. Are, are, are you related to Neil Armstrong? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that. Most, day, most of the time people ask Lance Armstrong now because they don't remember. <laughs> no, there's no, no relation to, uh, to Neil Armstrong. Although uh, when I was a kid, um, I always thought about uh, wanting to go to space and go to go to the moon. And then it turned out that I'm one of those people who would like to be the type of person who could go to space. I can't even play like video games without getting motion sickness. So. Um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not space, yeah. space material. 
a good question. Um, let's see, who else wants to go next? Scott, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Scott Pearl. Um, I'm a geobiologist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, I've been there for about nine years. Um, and, and as Bonnie mentioned, uh, I've been interested in terms of Great Salt Lake as an analog for Mars uh, for, I guess, for the last 10 years or so. And, um, and so we've done work out there on these evaporite minerals that essentially preserve signs of life as well as life itself um, inside salt mineral fluid inclusions, essentially, and how, they're, and how that, these kind of habitats can kind of last over geologic time. And so what we're landing on Mars uh, in terms of Jezero Crater had signs of these same kind of hydrated minerals. And so it'll be the first time that, that it will be able to go to a site that has had um, a ton of, of, of just really nice orbital coverage uh, to get an idea of, of what these mineral suites are and then essentially land at the same areas that we've seen from orbit. Um, and so uh, just happy to be here today. And, um, and thank you guys for having me. Awesome. And uh, let's see, Rachel, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Rachel Lemons, and I am a senior at Weber State University. I'll be graduating this semester with my degree in astrophysics. And um, thank you, yes, for my senior project. I actually did some computational analysis on terraforming Mars and what it would take to make it habitable, more Earth-like. Um, you know, with water and atmosphere, breathable oxygen and soil that can um, have plants grow through it. And um, with that, I also directed a um, production. It's going to be called the Martian Initiative, and it will be a planetarium show. So that is looking to be done hopefully later this year. Our um, filming got cut short due to COVID. So if you guys are in the area, you'll totally have to come by our planetarium when that show is done and see it and learn all about terraforming Mars. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. Mm -hmm. And let's see, who Colby, I don't think you've introduced yourself yet. Hey, everyone. I'm Colby Farron. I'm, uh, I'm a student at Weber State University. I... Uh, uh, I'm a planetarium assistant here. I'm just, I'm stoked about space. And also I, I'm stoked about, uh, let's see some shout outs here. Horace Mann, sixth grade, stoked about <laughs> Horace Mann, sixth grade, welcome. And it looks like uh, Mrs. E's amazing fifth grade students at Doxy Elementary also watching. Nice. Uh, just a few shout outs here. Anyway, I'm, I'm excited to be, be with you guys here on this uh, exciting day. Love space. Uh, I love thinking about aliens, figuring out what a, what 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 kind of life could be out there if it is out there, and how we could uh, how we could, I guess, find signs of life that is out there or was out there. And so, anyway, obviously today's an exciting day. So cool, excited to be here. Yeah, and and Scott, I think someone said hello to you too, Dana at the veterinary uh, op optimal mix consulting <laughs> do you don't know if you know no dana there i can't pronounce uh words that yeah i do yeah yeah. So awesome. <laughs> yeah everybody. Carson, how are you doing hey so hello everyone uh my name is carson matthews i'm a physics major at weber state uh emphasis on astrophysics which is why i'm super excited for today uh i am a associate at the op planetarium uh, and I've, I've been helping Rachel with her Mars show. And uh, yeah, I'm just here to answer any questions in the chat and help anyone out. Great, and Nate. All right, hi, uh, I'm Nate Tanner. Uh, I also am a physics student at Weber State University and I work at the Ott Planetarium and with uh, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, I kind of help them out with like more media related things. And I'm also doing research at the university. I'm starting doing research on variable stars, but I'm in agreement with everyone else that space is really cool. I think today's going to be really exciting and I got fingers crossed. This is going to go smoothly and everything's going to work out well, but excited to be here. And I'm glad everyone else is watching too. Awesome. That's great. So Jamie, should we just fire up NASA TV and see what's going on over there on the on the main channel. Yeah, I always, uh, you know, I, 
I've uh, been a computer simulation person for most of my career, but yet these days when the when the lander is heading down, I don't sleep the night before and I get very excited uh, and I'm not even uh, on the mission. I can't even imagine how those who are <laughs> must feel if I get this excited from just uh, from just looking from the sidelines. So let's see what let's see what NASA's got going on. So those are images from uh, Curiosity, right, Scott? Must be. Yeah, pretty sure. Um, it just kind of clocked out, but uh, it must be. I didn't see what what uh, what the last. Oh, I'm was. sorry. I'm watching a live feed on our Facebook, which is behind the schedule there. So. Ah. Yeah. So now they're. I guess they're just showing us our countdown here. So we've got two hours and ten minutes to go. Um, I do have a question. What is Go for the, it. What is the atmosphere like inside Mission Control? What's it like to Ooh, be in Mission Control? Yeah, Kindle? Scott would be the person to. Yeah, so um, very directed, um, very, very uh, focused, and um, everyone doing what they can um, in terms of getting all the information that they need advising who they need to and um just keeping everyone apprised as things as kind of dynamically move forward so yeah it's it's as you can think of it is it is it really loud or is it quiet like you know there i imagine people typing or being like typing uh, you cut out a little bit. Um, so yeah, it's uh, um, it's not it's not loud. You have to be able to do what you're doing. I guess kind of right in front of you. Um, so uh, in terms maybe local conversations within within the rooms, but uh, uh, for the most part, it's um, it's a it's it's mostly quiet. I mean, everyone has to you know focus and all that. But um, uh, I guess kind of background. I guess noise in terms of people talking. So it's it's a it's nice, it, you know, good, good kind of background rhythm for everyone to stay calm. <laughs> I had a question about Moki Marbles. Um, I just, the, I just answered it in the. Oh, good. Answer it live too. Do the blueberries in Utah's Moki Marbles have an evaporite history? Yeah, I've got a picture of them up if you want me to share them. But uh, if we're watching this, I won't do that. Um, Go ahead, show them. I just okay. Them. So, um, University of Utah's Margie Chan in the geology department. This is a paper of hers, um, but she published a paper relating to these marbles that the Hopi um, uh, and Navajo used to think of as spirits playing marbles. These marbles that we find in southern Utah are related to similar structures on Mars, and somebody's in the chat, Scott, if they are evaporates. And I know they form in the presence of water as the water comes through the sandstone and allows these iron concretions to form, but I don't think they'd be considered evaporates, would they? Question uh, not, not specifically. So, so the ones that, that I guess are the, are the more well-known ones uh, formed as actual groundwater um, came up through the surface and then essentially settled um, uh, and then essentially breached the actual surface itself, you know, from the ground um and then that those same fluids were actually used to form the mineral so when we think about of actual classic evaporite minerals the entire fluid evaporates in order to form the mineral structure itself so think of the the actual chemistry of of those same fluids that are directly used to form the mineral kinetics or at least using mineral kinetics uh to form the minerals that you that, that you see once all the water is actually evaporated so it's not just the fact that you have water itself, but the volume of that water, um, what the water chemistry is and how long it takes. So fast versus slow evaporation um, and what the temperatures are. So all of these play a huge role in the mineral kinetics to give you your final suite of minerals. So water has a role to play, uh, but, it, but it doesn't evaporate specifically to form what we're seeing. So the iron concretions, um, uh, you know, these are the Martian blueberries um uh they had water in their in their formation process not so much that 
that fluid evaporating. Yeah. And that's why, that's why it was, it was one of the first hallmark signs of presence of water on the surface of Mars. That's why they are pretty famous. Um, people are asking are oolitic sands related to the blueberries and they're not, um, they're calcium carbonate that layers around some organic matter. Jamie likes to tell everybody what that organic matter is. Don't you, Jamie? She's talking, but we can't hear her. <laughs> Jamie, we can't hear you. I know. Sorry. I'm working on the technology part. I can do one thing at a time. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get NASA TV up live again. I thought you'd like to say what was inside the, the uh, OODs because you like to talk about the OODs. Oh, yeah, because they're made out of brine shrimp fecal pellets. So we like to call them PUIDs um, <laughs> because the minerals wrap around the outside of the brine shrimp fecal pellets. You can't make this stuff up. This is science. This is science. <laughs> All right, we can, we can go back to streaming. I think that was such a good question though. I just was, I'm looking around and just making sure we're on the right YouTube channel. So, so we're getting live. Some other programs are starting to go live in 20 minutes. So I just want to make sure. Okay, good. Um, so uh, Amanda Field says, now my kiddos are wondering what minerals are on Mars. Scott, what do you want to say to that? So uh, in terms of mineral diversity, there it's, it's, pretty significant. Um, uh, specifically, the, the ones that we work with all have relationships to water. So you can get an idea about um, uh, when you have water after a mineral that's used water is actually formed, um, you can modify that mineral further. And so depending on how that mineral modification, or at least the actual extent of that modification has taken place, you can get an idea of how much water has actually been stable in these certain areas on Mars for, for certain periods of time longer than other ones. And so um, the, I guess the easiest way, or at least in terms of any kind of lake bed that you have near your home, if, if you have a lake bed or you can go to the ocean or whatever it is, any, any kind of body of water, you'll notice that um, when you have ice waters and ponds and lakes that are, that are essentially closed, there tends to be a higher salinity, just like Great Salt Lake compared to the ocean. And, and it can be upwards of, of probably 10, 10 times the amount of salt, uh, just because you don't have any room for that closed basin system for the water to go anywhere. So if it, if it gets salty, it will you know, stay salty and get saltier as time goes on. Whereas the ocean, you have constant kind of recycling um, and then movement of, of, of a certain ocean fluids. And so uh, lots of minerals, lots of ones that are, that are associated with water. Um, uh, yeah, definitely look it up because it's it's a it's a it's a nice suite of minerals that are there, very very pretty ones. Just covered with dust. That that's the only issue. <laughs> so we just had um, Amanda join our our panelists here. Amanda is uh, with the College of Science at Weber State University. I don't know if she's her or her video just went on. So uh, when she comes back, we'll introduce her. So are they giving us audio on this uh, feed, Jamie? Or is it just, yeah, okay, perfect. So I, you know, does, does everybody remember where they were when the last rover landed? I mean, I know Scott remembers, but any of our students remember <laughs> where they were when the last rover landed? <laughs> like seventh grade. <laughs> yeah, so did you watch it on, did you watch it on TV in, in school or what's, how did you find uh, out about it? You know, I, I recall hearing about it in one of my science classes. I think it was like earth science back in seventh grade, but yeah, uh, it, it was at school when I learned about it. Okay. Did they, did they, did they let you watch it live or? Hey attorneys, if that? you're looking to sign two to three more trust-based planning packages like this per week. Oh, hey, look, we're getting an advertisement. Check that out. <laughs> and we're back. Anybody else? I don't remember at all. There's certain things of my childhood that I remember, like the Twin Towers and stuff in school, but they never had this type of a show for us. So it's great. When, huh. was the last, when did the last rover land? We're like talking about time. It was oh, 10 years ago, yeah. Wait, what rover were you talking about? I was talking about curiosity. 
Which one were you talking about? Any of them. Uh, we have questions about when were the last, um, you know, rovers on Mars. I'll try and pull up some dates. So Jamie, I'm sending you a link to a NASA TV thing that probably doesn't have commercials in it. Ooh, thank you. That's I awesome. hope. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Whenever I show YouTube videos in class, I'm always like, Chrysler, Chrysler brings you the new. Uh, Much better. Yeah, classroom. Okay, so let's see. What are the questions here? We had uh, so questions about um, when the last rovers were. You know, it's funny. My entire career, it seems like, is is focused on watching rovers land. I remember when I was an undergraduate, the Mars Pathfinder um, lander landed. That was in '97. Um, that was the first mission on the surface of Mars for 20 years before that. I think Viking was in 1976, um, and then. Uh, after Pathfinder, I think, uh, what, Murr was 2004, and I'm thinking, you know, Rovers, um, and then Curiosity was 2000, and I want to say 12, but I might be wrong yeah. about that. It was Is 2012. Right? 2012. Um, and it's, and it's, you know, it, it's funny because when I was working on my PhD dissertation, there was really no evidence to speak of, of liquid water on the surface of Mars. And we thought it was this dry desiccated place where, you know, the chances of having any, um, any, certainly any current liquid water uh, was impossible. And now um, we seem to be finding more evidence all the time that there was at least water in the distant past um, and, and even some, maybe even today. So um, it's, and, it's and amazing what we've learned. The water that's there today, John, I just want to give a shout out is salty water. Oh yeah. Yeah. It has to <laughs> and, be. Yeah. And it has to be because if it's flowing at that temperature, you know, salt will prevent it from freezing. So these, um, the, there, there's some, um, slopes line and also some underwater, um, uh, underground, uh, sort subsurface water that's being explored and the idea is that it's brine it's salty i did put up this cool graphic for you john showing all of the different uh, can everybody see that all of mm -hmm. the different um uh, mars missions which uh, the ones that are this week are in blue um but i think it's it's really a kind of a cool graphic if you search it um you can find this um, I do. While you're on, Bonnie, we have a question about, um, can you elaborate on how you use the Great Salt Lake to recreate how salt on Mars can sustain microbes? How will this rover examine how salt crystals on Mars retain DNA? So I'll put up this little video um, I had up in case somebody asked that question. Um, so I want you to try to find the fluid inside this salt crystal. I'm going to play the video. So look very carefully at the salt crystal. This salt crystal is 253 million years old. So the fluid inside was water that was around the equator 250 million years ago before the dinosaurs, okay? So see if you see the water in there. That is awesome. Can you see that little bubble? So um, what we know is that particularly that, that fluid pockets, they call them inclusions in geology, fluid pockets um, get stored inside these mineral crystals. And as that salt is pressured over time, those pockets kind of come together. So to a molecular biologist, 100 microliters is a whole lot of fluid, but to most people it's not, but microbes don't care. Um, and so we have a lot of people on earth who've been studying salt biology, who have found ancient microbes and ancient DNA and ancient biological molecules inside the rock record on earth. So that's why we're excited about going to salty places, uh, mineral rich evaporates on Mars. That's why we salt biology people are pretty excited. And that's, so why I just, talk, oh, that's why we talk to people like Scott, geologist. Sorry, I was just looking back. Paul, did, were you just answer? I, I, I'm having a hard time paying attention to more than one thing at a time. So did you answer <laughs> Paul Nelson's question about? Uh, yeah. Uh, that's the one you just did. Okay, good. All right. All right. Paul just said you did. There you go. Perfect. We had a question about the atmosphere on Mars. Um, oh, do you want it? Do you want to feel that? <laughs> sure, absolutely. I pulled up a, are we allowed to share screens? Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm 
And, okay. and can I just um, go back while you're starting to share your screen? Yeah. Um, we have so many people. We have about 150 people that are watching online right now. And so um, I'm having trouble keeping up with questions. So there's two ways that you can ask, that you can interact. One is through the chat function. So you can do that through the webinar chat function. And then there's a little Q&A function. If you click on the Q&A and ask your question in, in text, we can keep track of them better. So ask mm -hmm. questions in Q&A, chat in the chat box. Um, and thank you so much for being here. And in those um, comment boxes, I want you to put, if you're watching from a school or you're watching from somewhere you want to tell us, please do that. And we will shout you out. We're really glad to see everybody here. Thank you, Rachel. Sorry to interrupt. No, you're fine. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so I just pulled this up. Sorry, I have two screens, so I'm like looking off at my other screen, which is why I'm turned into um, video. So this is just a quick little comparison of the atmospheres of Mars and Earth, and I did um, a little bit of analysis on this with my terraforming project. So as you can see, Mars has a large percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and of course, you know, if we breathe that in, um, you're not going to last long on the planet, and there's trace amounts of Things that we have here on Earth, like carbon monoxide, we're familiar with, methane, oxygen, water vapor. And then Earth, as you can see, is primarily nitrogen, um, but we do have a huge percentage of oxygen in our atmosphere also. And then trace amounts similar to Mars, carbon, um, you know, hydrogen, methane, water vapor. And so this is a comparison of the percentages. And then also um, keep in mind that Mars is about half the size of Earth. So putting the planet equally in size in this picture is a little misleading. Um, the planet is actually about half the size of Earth. Anybody else have anything to add to that? No, that's good. I was just trying to, oh, I think I, I was answering a question in the Q&A. So no, that's great. So what did you find out about what it would take to uh, turn Mars into Earth? It would take a lot. So <laughs> um, should we go? You want to hear more about sure. that? Sure, yeah. Um, so obviously, we would have to up the oxygen in the atmosphere and decrease the carbon dioxide. But a lot of the atmosphere on Mars has been stripped away over the years due to the magnetic field lines. Um, so as you know, Earth has a really strong magnetic field. And as uh, solar radiation comes from the sun, it knocks um, into those magnetic fields. And since Mars's magnetic field lines are um, not as strong as Earth's, a lot of the atmosphere has been stripped away over time. So what percentages of like carbon dioxide, nitrogen, argon actually in the atmosphere, it's very, very thin and it can't hold much. Um, so we would need to uh, increase the strength of Mars's magnetic field lines so that, um, you know, those solar winds coming through don't have as easy of a chance to knock the atmosphere away. So I've, I can see a few more questions coming in on the Q&A. Jamie, should we just uh, ask, answer those live? Yeah, let's, what, what about, you know, we've been talking about the atmosphere of Mars. Can you talk more about the MOXIE machine on Perseverance? I've got a good, uh, I've got a good graphic I can put up for that. Does somebody want to talk about MOXIE? I was, I was looking at Scott there. <laughs> <laughs> I nominate Scott. <laughs> Nobody knows who you're, who you're looking at. <laughs> if Percy were to go on a road trip, this is what a rover would take. So Moxie's over here. Let's see if I can make this bigger. I can't tell how big it is for you folks. Produces oxygen from Martian CO2. So this is one of the experiments to... Uh, think about people going to Mars. So one of the goals of perseverance is to, um, to, to sort of seek more information about 
uh, people traveling to Mars on a crewed mission um, and what that might look like. So is there a way to make oxygen? Um, so that's one of the experiments for people. There's another one that's testing different materials for spacesuits and how they hold up under Martian conditions, which I think is super interesting. Um, so that's what MOXIE is for, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. Do you, does anybody have any environmental concerns about this mission? Um, Ryan's been here, seeing a ton of these yellow and black Protect Wild Utah stickers that you see around here that have been uh, modified to say Protect Wild Mars. Mm. It could be jokes, um, but is NASA being sensitive of their impact? So I, I, do you mind if I take that just real quick? Um, you do it. The, uh, you know, the, the idea of protecting um, Mars from contamination is something that NASA takes pretty seriously. Um, you know, the the rovers that are set up there are are sterilized to make sure that they don't kind of forward contaminate from Earth. Um, and we're also mindful of bringing anything back from Mars. You know, if we ever do a Mars sample return mission, we don't want to bring stuff back from Mars to contaminate uh, laboratories on the Earth. Um, but you raise an interesting point about the, you know, kind of, you know, that that's thinking of like contaminating the site from scientific purposes and you know, or contaminating the samples coming back. But there has been a lot of discussion about um, kind of the protection of Mars as a place. Um, and I remember there was a few years ago, there was a big, uh, there was an article out with a debate about, uh, you know, whether, whether we should preserve uh, Mars as kind of a pristine location. Um, and the, the thing about Mars is that, you know, if we, uh, if we find life up there and it turns out to be life that is not at all like the life that we see on earth, um, then it becomes a place where, you know, the, to study it was going to be something we're going to have to be extremely cautious with, not only to not impact it, but also just to study it. You know, it's the only other example of a place that that didn't have life. And it's perhaps even more interesting if, and this sounds strange to say, but it's more interesting if Mars doesn't have any life, um, because it clearly had environments where you could have life. And if it turns out it doesn't have any, um, that that's a very interesting uh, problem or a very interesting answer to that question. And, and then the open question is, do you still preserve that space? Um, you know, is, does it have value as a, as a pristine environment, even if life doesn't exist there? And people debate these things, philosophers debate these things, people have all sorts of fun arguments about it. Um, but, but yeah, that, it's an interesting, uh, I hadn't seen the stickers for Wild Mars, um, <laughs> but, uh, but there are people who think hard about this. Um, and um, Matt wants to know, so to make Mars habitable, would, would introducing cyanobacteria to create a great oxidation event similar to what happened here on Earth be reasonable? So, so we would not want to do that. Um, <laughs> uh, in terms of bringing life to Mars and then separate, I mean, first of all, we don't want to do that, period. Second of all, um, to, to bring Earth life to Mars purposely would kind of negate the search for life elsewhere. Um, we wouldn't be able to, to really separate, it would be very hard to separate um, us looking for life that we'd essentially seed on another planet versus life that was already there to begin with. So separate origins of life. Um, so uh, in terms of the GOE and, and, and the time that it would take, obviously there's there's a difference between naturally happening it on, on a planet versus it being something that, that we do via potentially terraforming and things like that. Uh, more toward the former, um, it, it would make sense um, uh, that we have as, as, as small of an impact to Mars as we can in terms of human exploration. So um, there are certain special regions that we don't even go to in terms of, um, of just rovers in general because of, uh, of, of, of having the actual potential of water being there presently in terms of you know, very salty brines. On the flip side, those are also uh, really nice areas to essentially go and study. And so you, you have to balance the protection of these sites um, to actually be like the main science that, that you'd want to do. So, um, yeah. Well, 
Hey, we have about three minutes until the really good live NASA stream starts, but I do want to call out to some people because we've got some folks from Antelope Island State Park. Hi, Trish. Thanks for coming. Um, we've got people from Denver, Colorado with Kaiser Elementary School kids and students. Nice. Um, I'm from Denver. Woo. Yay. Oh, <laughs> Alyssa Frado, she's one of our alumni at Westminster College. She's watching from the lab at Biofire, Biofire Diagnostics. And she stud, studied Bonneville salt flats microbes. <laughs> so uh, Lauren's, she's in, uh, Lauren is in Ogden and has peanuts at the ready. Is, is that <laughs> you're going to be the peanut gallery or how, like, I don't, uh. I, so we need some fun. <laughs> Uh, Joanna is watching from Los Angeles um, from fourth grade at Citizens of the World Charter School in Mar Vista. That's so cool. I love that. Uh, who else do we have here? Zelda is from South Africa is with us. Who we have another person from South Africa. I don't know if Kayla's on or not. Um, uh, I wanted to say just a bit about planetary protection really quickly. Um, when NASA started in 1958, they took on um, a dude called Joshua Lederberg, who was a microbial geneticist. Um, and he went to them and said, if you're starting a space organization, you have to deal with planetary protection. Mm -hmm. We have to think about sending microbes off the planet and we have to think about bringing microbes back on the planet. Um, and I'm gonna show you just one quick picture because it is the, one of, not this, okay, hang on. Can you see Joshua Lederberg? I can't yeah. tell the up. Okay. So here he is, and he joins NASA in 1958, which started the first astrobiology. They called it exobiology. So exobiology started when NASA started. I wanted to say that. A lot of people don't know that. But here's my favorite picture, which is the quarantining of the Apollo 11 <laughs> astronauts. So even the president couldn't talk to them because they might be carrying moon bugs, just so you know. <laughs> I noticed somebody somebody did bring up something in the chat about um, planetary protection and, and commercial space flight. And, and that was the first thing I thought when Elon Musk launched the Tesla into space, which went past Mars's orbit. I mean, forever after now, we have a race car in space. And, and that's on the one hand, fantastic, because NASA never would have done that. Um, they never would have just put a car in a, in a launch vehicle and sent it into space. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it just, just kind of demonstrates that, uh, you know, private exploration can be a little, a little bit of a loose cannon. So it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. I hope that uh, Elon Musk is on board with uh, planetary protection as much as NASA is. So. For the next Tesla. The next, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> They're all Tesla. There you go. I'm going to start sharing the NASA live, but I do want to re uh, recognize that we have some um, the Seattle Sounders Academy soccer players and student athletes that are watching. And awesome, well, and, well, with, I, and with and with and with an astrobiologist even. There's awesome. a, a great uh, yeah someone from our from our astro astrobiology program at University of Washington is their their coach what? so. <laughs> Okay, and somebody said something about peanuts are super, this is Sky. Hi, Sky. thank you for coming. Um, peanuts are a superstitious thing from JPL. Scott, can you tell what? me about that? What is that? Do you know anything about peanuts and superstitious? Yeah, yeah. Um, so in terms of does. the peanut gallery, uh, um, it's just good luck in terms of us, us being able to, to have a, a small little jar of peanuts. Um, the one from, I think probably, I probably both missions in terms of them still being in mission control um, are they're on a little desk. And so uh, uh, they're just there. And uh, it's, 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 you know, it's all for good luck. And so I'm sure, I'm sure people have their own at home as well as the ones that are, uh, that are at mission control right now. Wow. Um, we, ha we have, we've somebody joined our panel. Um, Nisi, you want to wave for us? Nisi's our assistant director of the planetarium. So I'm very happy Nisi's joined us today. Hey, Scott. Great to be here. Do you know Mark, Mark Rober? That was a question for you, Scott. <laughs> Mark Rover? Yeah. I don't know, like R-O-V-E-R, -E Rover? R-O-B-E-R. -R -E uh, I've seen his YouTube videos. Uh, 
I don't know him. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's, he's I, the I, is he the engineer that does the like the glitter bombs? That and I, I, I think I saw one where he did a squirrel uh, test in his backyard. Yeah. Um, that was pretty cool. But uh, yeah. no, I've not met him. Um, we definitely overlapped. I think he was on lab uh, for about nine years, and I just celebrated my my ninth year uh, just a couple months ago. And so um, there was some overlap, but uh, different uh, groups, different divisions. We're still waiting for NASA Live. Maybe um, Dr. Alexander Griffin wants to ask us. Hi, Alex. Oh, hi, Alex. <laughs> um, what kind of sample size uh, do we expect to be able to bring back to Earth? I know Bonnie has some answers about that. Yeah, Scott does too, I think. I, I've been really angry about it, which is why Jamie says I have answers. Um, the, uh, they're about the size of my Star Wars Chewbacca, if you remember, Alex, that I have in my office. They're 10 centimeters, um, uh, tiny little cores. And um, geologists would rather have big cores and would rather them be deeper. Um, but the deeper you go and the bigger the cores, the more expensive and heavier the equipment is. So this is what we're gonna get are these, is that right, Scott, 10 centimeters? I believe so. Um, I'm sure that 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 there is some thickness in terms of the actual as cash itself, uh, just because leaving it on the surface for for the the eventual fetch rover sometime yeah. later to get it, you'll have to worry about it being on the surface and stay in uh, still in the same as relative condition uh, from once it's actually used versus collected and then sent back. And so um, uh, it's the yeah. So in terms of size, I think that's about right. I did just start to uh, show NASA live. Sky crane. I love that. It's like something out of Batman. So Scott, I have to be honest. When I saw the sky crane on Curiosity, I, when I first saw that, I was like, no, no way. <laughs> Welcome to NASA's awesome. Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. Agreed. I, we're I was up terrified of the whole idea. We're gearing up rover to touch down on Mars. Happening in an hour and a half from now, the rover will attempt to land in Jezero Crater. It is the most difficult landing site on Mars ever attempted. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Raquel Villanueva. In the past, mission team members gathered in our mission control for landings. But this time around, we have COVID safety measures in place. Today's landing will look a little different than what you've seen before. I am in a room by myself, and so is my co-host. Here in the Space Flight Operations Facility, team members are in different parts of this building. Some are in mission control. Others are upstairs for landing operations. We also have isolated rooms for our guests on this show. In total, we have eight locations covered by 14 robotic cameras that you will be seeing. One of those locations is the dark room, the heart of NASA's deep space network. Think of it as a giant communication switchboard. This is where spacecraft phone home to us from across the solar system and interstellar space. The deep space network has been tracking Perseverance since it left Earth. And there are lots of ways you can watch landing today. We have a 360-degree camera inside the control room. It lets you experience the landing right along with the team while seeing this broadcast. We also have the clean feed. It shows an uninterrupted view of mission control and audio. También tenemos un programa en español. To tell us about it is host Diana Trujillo, who also works on the mission. Thank you, Raquel. We're so excited to be the sister live broadcast in Spanish. Sintonizate nuestro programa en las redes sociales de Twitter, YouTube y Facebook en la NASA en Español para que nos acompañes a un tour virtual de la NASA con entrevistas con astronautas, con participación de artistas, con entrevistas con científicos e ingenieros de Perseverance, con Plaza Sésamo y mucho más. Te esperamos. Gracias, Diana. And don't forget, we want to see how you are watching the landing today. Use the hashtag Countdown to Mars to send us your photos and videos. To preview what interviews are coming up is my co-host from the JPL News Office, Marina Jurica. 
Thanks so much, Raquel. The excitement is building behind me right here in Mission Control as we count down to the Perseverance landing. We will be talking to some of the many people who made today possible, from scientists to engineers on the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover team to folks from NASA headquarters giving us a look into the future of Mars exploration. A little later, we will also be speaking with the students who named the rover and the helicopter. Inspirational stories as we prepare for another landing on the red planet. Back to you, Raquel. Thanks, Marina. Let's give a shout out to the students around the nation learning about Perseverance's mission to Mars with their teachers. We're happy you're with us on this exciting day. Later in the show, we will be answering some of the questions you submitted through your classrooms. Landing on Mars is complex. The team will be calling out milestones as they happen. It's fast paced and you'll hear lots of technical terms. To help us translate and explain what is going on in Mission Control is Swati Mohan. She is part of Perseverance's landing team. Thanks for guiding us through landing today, Swati. Hi, Raquel. I'm happy to be here today. So, Swati, what is the status of the Perseverance rover right now? So, Perseverance is still in space right now, about 9,000 miles from Mars. So far, she is healthy and on course. And it takes time to send signals between Earth and Mars. Can you let us know how that affects the information you are seeing? Mm -hmm. So Mars is about 127 million miles from Earth right now. That means it takes about 11 minutes from light to travel from Mars to Earth. So all the information that we receive from Perseverance actually happened 11 minutes ago. So the round trip is 22 minutes for us to send a command to Perseverance and hear back on the ground that she's received that command. This is what we call two-way light time. That's good to know. And can you tell us who else is in the room with you right now? The operations team is split into two different areas. Here in the cruise mission support area, we have primarily the team that has been flying Perseverance from Earth to Mars. You'll see the placards with the roles of each of the people by their stations. Some of the people you may hear talking today are the flight director, who is the conductor of our operations orchestra here, the entry, descent, and landing activity lead, who is a member of the landing team tasked with understanding the execution of entry, descent, and landing, and then also the telecommunications and entry, descent, and landing communications engineers who will be monitoring the signal from Perseverance through the different paths that we have. Upstairs in what we call the war room, we have almost the entire entry, descent, and landing operations team. And then across the hall from them, we have the surface mission control room where the surface operations team is ready and waiting to take over as soon as Perseverance's wheels touch the ground. And you have been part of this mission for years now. Can you tell us what have you been working on? I've been working on Perseverance for almost eight years now as a guidance, navigation, and control engineer working primarily on entry, descent, and landing. One of my big tasks was to help with terrain relative navigation. Perseverance will be the first mission to fly terrain relative navigation so while she is descending on the parachute, she'll actually be looking at the ground with a camera, seeing where she is with respect to the Martian surface and choosing a safe spot to land that she can get to. After so many years of working on the mission, it's an honor to be here today as the mission commentator. We're happy to have you here. Thanks, Swati. We'll be checking back in with you in just a few minutes as Perseverance approaches its next milestone. But for now, let's learn more about the rover's mission once it lands on Mars. You know, Mars is the closest place that we can reach with robotic exploration that we think had a really good chance of having ancient life. The Perseverance rover will land at a location called Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is a very interesting place. It's a crater that once held a lake. There are a lot of craters on the surface of Mars that could have once hosted ancient lakes, but not every crater that we think had a lake actually preserves evidence that that lake was there. 
It had an inflow channel and it had an outflow channel. That means it was filled, the crater was filled with water. In Jezero, we have probably one of the most beautifully preserved delta deposits on Mars in that crater. This is a wonderful place to live for microorganisms, and it is also a wonderful place for those microorganisms to be preserved so that we can find them now so many billions of years later. There is no other place on Mars that has the unique combination of a lake setting, a beautifully preserved delta, and the diverse mineralogy that we have in Jezero Crater. So it's truly a special landing site. The major goal of the Perseverance mission is to investigate astrobiology on Mars, and in particular, to address the question of whether life ever existed on Mars. The Perseverance rover starts with a design that's very similar to Curiosity. We've added to it a whole new set of science instruments, and these science instruments were purposefully selected to help us in the search for biosignatures. We're going to be taking uh, microphones with us for the first time we're going to have uh, that human sense on another planet. Good idea, Jamie. carries with her a grand experiment thoughts. in space-faring technology, a helicopter, the name of which... It's the helicopter. One of the major upgrades that Perseverance has from Curiosity is that it's able to self-drive for a distance of up to 200 meters per day. As the rover is driving, it's literally building the map of the road it's driving on on Mars. Scientists for years have told us that to really unlock the secrets of Mars, we have to bring samples from Mars back to Earth. So what Mars 2020 is going to do is to drill samples, put them in small tubes. We're going to seal it in its own individual tube. We set them on the surface to provide a target for the second two missions, which hopefully will get in development in the next several years and could potentially get the samples back to Earth by 20 Yeah, some folks were asking about this. Perseverance is a very, very profound first step in both our understanding of our place in the universe and a stepping stone towards human exploration on Mars. I, I think people think that, you know, what, what good could a sample be from Mars, but being able to pick up even a small amount of stuff from someplace that we know where it came from is really important. I also think uh, you, you alluded to this, John, um, but I think whether Mars is habitable and whether Mars is or was inhabited are two different questions. Yes. Um, John studies habitability issues on exoplanets and I, I love I love the way that you talked about that with my class. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's uh, uh, yeah. Oh, I, I got a, I'm getting a feedback there. Yeah, the, uh, it, it's interesting that the, uh, you know, if you think about whether or not something uh, can have life versus whether or not it does. I mean, one of the things about Mars is that it doesn't scream life the way Earth does. Um, so if there is life on Mars today that's alive, it's, it's subtle. I also want to mention somebody asked that question about cyanobacteria um, and should we put it there? Um, and we talked about that, but we didn't talk about, I think what the question was also getting at is that cyanobacteria we expect to be important of, in the evolution of a planet um, as, as it goes through abiogenesis and, and life forms and then that microbial life gets to Get, gets to create an oxygenated environment. That's what we saw on Earth. And um, just so you know, we are going to look for evidence of mats, of cyanobacterial mats on, on Mars with the Perseverance mission. So I did want to point to that. Stromatolite-like structures um, will be examined if they're found. So you you guys are talking about uh, potential life on Mars. I have a, I have a slideshow prepared that I can't you guys set it up too perfectly I can't let's do throw, it not throw it in right now let's so let me it. just uh let me share my screen here and uh, Jamie can you can you let him share his screen I I think it automatically oh will it okay let's me yep there we go sweet okay <laughs> so really quick I know we have uh, we have lots of different levels of people listening here we have uh, people from uh college students uh, all the way down to there's there's several elementary classrooms that I know are watching. So hopefully this will be uh, kind of engaging for, for a wide audience of people. 
um, let's geek out about aliens. So um, we know first that we got to keep our expectations in check, okay? We can't go crazy with our expectations. We have to realize that we are never going to find aliens. That's true. That's the fact because one, there are no other stars like our sun in the entire universe. And there are no other planets with liquid water like our earth at all anywhere in the universe. Uh, right? right. False, <laughs> as, as Dwight from The Office would say. Um, uh, and as Dwight would say, fact, there are billions of stars like the, like the sun in our galaxy. This is one thing I think, remembering um, growing up, one misconception that, that I had about, uh, and we have some astrobiologists here who can, who can maybe expand on this, but um, uh, when, when you're growing up, at least for me, it seemed kind of like, Oh, well, there, we don't, there's no life anywhere else because there's no stars that are anything like our sun and there's no planets that are anything like our planet. Um, when the more we study, the more we see uh, there are billions of stars like the sun just in our galaxy. That's just Milky Way. That's excluding all the other galaxies. Um, billions, big, big numbers we're talking about. So then, um, then we see that many of these stars have planets that in theory could harbor life. They're in what's called the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone. Uh, Goldilocks, of course, being, uh, being the fabled fairy tale about, um, about Goldilocks. She goes into the house with, or no, excuse me, the three bears go into Goldilocks' house. Um, no, Goldilocks, oh my goodness, I'm getting <laughs> Goldilocks that goes into the house of the three bears and she tries the different por the pottages, porridge. Anyway, there's two, one that's too hot, one that's too cold, and one that's just right. Uh, the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone refers to the distance from a star that a planet needs to be in order to have liquid water. And therefore, because as we understand it, life, requires liquid water so it would therefore be habitable or just right um if we ask google how many of these planets there are i know we have we have experts here but if we just went straight to google then we would see the first answer google tells us 300 million that's google's google's go-to answer now even if you don't trust google you think it's the eye of sauron or something um that's fine. Still millions, millions of potential habitable uh, or, or at least Goldilocks zone um, exoplanets just in our galaxy. Oh, and one more thing. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I get so excited about this stuff. <laughs> one more thing. Many of these stars are older than our sun. Our sun depicted here on the left. Now, it's not fair of course, to call our, our sun a baby star. We're, we're talking about, you know, about 4.6 billion years old. Uh, but, but still, if we were to talk about the sun, if we were to think about it in a, in a family of stars in our Milky Way galaxy, that's about 13.5 or so billion years old, uh, our sun's kind of a middle child. Uh, not, exactly, not exactly the oldest child of the bunch of all the stars. So, Oh, wait, one more, one more thing. I forgot. <laughs> this, okay, Elon Musk, a week ago, uh, just a week ago on a podcast, uh, suggested that where we are right now, uh, it would actually only take a million years from where we are right now to colonize the entire gal galaxy. Uh, a few million years, other people estimate, uh, is all we need to travel the galaxy. Basically, we're not talking about billions. We're talking about a million to a few million years with sublight travel to travel the galaxy so just to reestablish everything we are right now uh it would actually take a million years there have been millions of years for aliens to travel to us at first million years other people or communicate with us we need to travel the galaxy basically we're not billions of sun-like stars Sublight travel. From millions of yeah. theoretically habitable planets. Just to reestablish everything. Just counting the ones from our own galaxy, not counting all the ones from other galaxies. 
are right now. Millions of years. So, to travel to us. where is everybody? Um, this, and I know this, this idea won't be, won't be new to many of you, but to some of you, this may be the first time that, that it's presented like this. Uh, if, if you guys are elementary kids, where is everybody? It's not like there's not other Earth-like planets out there. It's not like there's not other sun-like stars out there. There's billions and billions. And they've had, several of them have had billions of years to potentially send life to us. So where is everybody? Um, this is, so this is known as the Fermi paradox. Basically, this, uh, this physicist years ago named Enrico, uh, I believe it was Enrico uh, Fermi, um, he was talking with his colleagues about this whole idea and, and suggested like, no, really, where is everybody? All the statistics, all the probability suggests that when we look out, we should be able to see life somewhere or that life has visited us or, or would visit us that we would be able to, to see evidence of life. And yet somehow we don't, um, so how do we understand why there is life on earth? Well, one way is by visiting those planets inhabitable zones. We just, we go out to all of the billions of planets and we visit those planets and we see, okay, what's going on here that isn't going on on earth or what's going on on earth that isn't going on here. Unfortunately, uh, space is huge and we can't exactly visit all of those billions of planets uh, or millions, billions, depending on, on Google and, and uh, other people's answers. Um, we, we haven't been able to do that. So, wait, why are we visiting Mars again? All of this circling back? Um, if you look at the habitable zone, a little, a little diagram here. Now, there's different, um, there's differing, uh, theories on what actually is a habitable zone. Uh, we have some experts here can, that can maybe expound on this. Um, but if we look at, at, these are several different planets that we've, we've been able to see. Not all, obviously not all of these are in our solar system. Uh, but if we look at ones in our solar system here, Earth right beautifully in this line of the habitable Goldilocks zone. There's an optimistic one that's a little bit bigger. Um, but even a conservative one, at least on this diagram, again, there's, there's different debate among scholars. But if you look right here on the right, you'll notice Mars right on the edge uh, of, of this Goldilocks zone that theoretically means that w given the right atmosphere and, and as was discussed earlier, a, a magnetic field that allows uh, Mars to retain an atmosphere and other conditions, um, it's far enough or close enough to the sun that it is in technically a habitable zone to have liquid water. And even in the past, as was mentioned, there's more evidence that Mars did at one point have liquid water. Um, so if it, if it once had liquid water, could it have had life? Um, that's, that's one of the big questions. And, and really as we study Mars, one of the many reasons, obviously there's several other reasons. I'm really excited about the, obviously the, the alien and life and the Fermi paradox and all of this potential. There's other reasons too, but one big thing for me is that studying Mars helps us learn more about our own planet uh, and, and life itself. Because as we learn about um, what, uh, as was said, whether there is evidence of life that we're able to find on Mars, or if there's not, what this does is all of this data helps us understand what makes a planet habitable at all, what uh, what life is, why why we have this crazy thing called life here on planet Earth, and really, uh, that, that's one of the big things that I think is super cool about going to Mars, one of the big reasons is that uh, it's us trying to figure out this mystery of life, this mystery of the Fermi paradox and where is everybody? And it helps us get a little bit closer to understanding what it is about Earth um, that, that makes life possible. And if it potentially is possible 
in other places. Uh, I could go off about the great filter and things like that, but I think I'm going to stop there. Basically, um, I'm excited about learning about what we find from Mars insofar as it helps us answer this question of what is life and what makes life. So That's awesome. there, I think that is the end of my slideshow. Awesome. Um, you know, Colby, whenever I hear about the Jeremy paradox, I always pull us oh. back. Let's see. Sorry. Let's stop sharing. Pull off about the great film. Um, beautiful. Like that, but I think I'm going to okay. stop there. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for letting me go on that. Spiel. No, no I, worries. I'm, I was just way too excited about that. No, that's good. I, in fact, whenever you talk about the Fermi paradox, I always think about, uh, you know, the, the fact that we've sent probes out. <laughs> so at least somebody's out there. So how's our NASA TV doing, Jamie? I'm just sharing. And, there's, and it's impossible to be way too excited about any of this. I don't care. This is awesome. This is... getting ready for landing while doing it all from home there's no doubt that working in isolation not virtual isolation we haven't talked about this enough the fact that nasa is pulling this off we had to during the middle of a pandemic is just think and amazing design what it meant to operate a spacecraft makes me feel bad about ever complaining about teaching on zoom in the same room in mission control seeing the data come down from perseverance it was, it was a major change going to that you know looking at everyone on a screen instead of in person because of the pandemic you can't uh you know just pop over your cubicle wall and talk to the person next to you it's definitely been a challenge to figure out how to communicate and uh, get everything done remotely um, but we've managed to make it work Scott, do you think that this is going to change the way NASA to go into the operates unknown. now that people and have gotten some familiarity with this type of work? Of the unknown. In terms of, really of just remote operations? Or in yeah. Terms of just, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, you know, in terms of all work environments, I think, um, as being able to kind of streamline things to not only, you know, the same issue happened when we have meetings just in person where there's always more, more actual content than there is... Um, Time to talk about it. So having, uh, you know, kind of meeting fatigue, or at least kind of reducing that over time, um, kind of forces you to stream on things. But there is something to be said about not being able to just kind of walk over to your, as to a colleague's office, to have a conversation. So um, uh, kind of balancing those two, I think, is going to be a challenge in the future for you know, kind of deep thinking, not just being able to get tasks done, but really kind of thinking about uh, what's going on. Yeah, I can totally see that. Uh, I remember back right after I got out of graduate school, I got to go to the JPL Planetary Science Summer School where we did kind of a mock mission planning. And uh, we went into the, uh, what they call it, Team X mi mission room, I think at that time they called that. And and they had all the engineers sitting in front of their computers, you know, updating spreadsheets in real time. And they were all interconnected and all this type of stuff. And, um, and it was, it was such an energetic environment with everybody in the room talking to each other and shouting at each other, trying to figure out how to plan the different things. And when I thought about, you know, trying to run something like this without being in the same room with people, I, I just thought it was incredibly difficult. Um, so it's, it's really amazing. Yeah, um, definitely in terms of, uh, you know, going from the environment to making that work uh, versus, uh, as the quality of the content, if you're having to manage that, there, there's a huge trade-off. And so, you know, in terms of having times that are devoted for for the full thought process versus um, now you can go into kind of autopilot mode to do specific things. I think we've all gone through that in, in, the, in the last year in terms of, of um, you know, going from I need to focus on this versus I can have seven meetings back to back over Zoom and WebEx. and. Uh, and both of them are fine, but you can't really mix the two. Yeah. Well, and I was even thinking about it from our students' perspective. I've got students who are graduating and applying for graduate school, and they're doing virtual interviews for graduate school. And I, I don't even know how you make a decision if you don't get to go visit the place and see the environment and look at the laboratory space. And so I, I my, my heart reaches out for everyone who's trying to manage this. Yeah, definitely. Mission. 
Uh, and then almost every other NASA center has contributed in some significant and critical way as well. Uh, we have um, over a thousand industry partners that have provided hardware into this mission from 44 different states, 60 different cities. And of course, we have international contributions from Europe and many other international providers as well. So it's a, it's a big team. It's taken a lot of people to get us uh, to where we're at. That is a big team. This is the most difficult landing site ever attempted. Now, why do you think Perseverance is ready to land in Jezero Crater now? Jezero is tough. I mean, it's scientifically fascinating uh, because it's got a lot of things like craters and, uh, uh, you know, rock fields and cliffs and sand dunes and that sort of thing, which are great for the science community. That's exactly the type of features they're looking for to learn more about Mars. But they're all landing hazards for us. Uh, and so we've had to add new technology uh, to remote navigation, which is the ability essentially to divert away from hazards. Uh, and But we have taken this system through the same types of paces that we have in previous missions. We've used the same techniques, the same uh, best practices for engineering verification. And in many cases, uh, we've used the same people. This, in fact, is my, my fifth Mars rover mission, and I'm not alone. There's other people on the project in the same, in the same situation. So, um, you know, the team has given it everything they've gotten uh, uh, to put it all put it all out there and uh, to make this successful, and I think we're ready. Thanks, Matt, and good luck on your fifth mission. So if someone had asked a question well, earlier about how much this mission costs, and according to Google, it's about $2.7 billion, dollars, and I promised them that every penny was spent on the Earth. Science goals of the mission. We're good. It's yeah, so I mean, in terms of the cost, <laughs> the, the, the launch vehicle is the most expensive, but there was um, a comparison uh, for MSL in terms of cost where it was basically the equivalent of, of every person in America buying one movie ticket uh, once in, in 10 years. Yeah. So if you can spend, spend one, you know, like money in, in, in a 10 years on a movie ticket, that amount of money would, would then fully correlate. And, what, the and I haven't been to a movie in 12 months, so yeah. we can just bank that for the next rover. <laughs> and this is this is not movie ticket prices currently. I think right. the movie ticket prices back in like the 90s. So, um, yeah. or if anything now, probably a coffee. <laughs> yeah. concentrate and preserve organics and, and special support coffee. microbial life. We're also excited because Jethro uh, exposes rocks that um, are- Yeah, they opened a Starbucks in our in the basement of our building, and I, I thought with the amount of money faculty had spent on that, we probably could have launched something what do you yeah. in the space. <laughs> or something better than Starbucks. Yeah, right. <laughs> His hands down, I think the most re re rewarding discovery I think we can make with Perseverance would be finding a truly compelling ancient biosignature. God, I'm noticing that people are still wearing Mars 2020 logo instead of Perseverance. I know it's the same logo, but it's still going to be called Mars 2020 forever. I still call Mer Mer. I think it's a product of working on it and essentially actually getting data from from these missions, you know, raw data, and then being able to use it for scientific research, um, you tend to, to see these, these these amazing instruments, um, and the whole payload that goes on them um, as what you first heard them to be, so before their name, essentially. Um, and so, uh, it's nice that that they that they get named, but just to kind of shout out the Mars orbiters. So I worked on on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter for about seven years. Um, and so orbiters aren't normally named, or they're, they're, they're actually not named uh, um, in terms of the kind of nicknames that the rovers have gotten. And one of the ideas is that in terms of the, the face on, a, on, the, on the Mars rover is essentially you can kind of get an idea about like, like the human version of a like face with the cameras and all of that, whereas orbiters are, look more like birds in terms of the solar panels and all of that. Um, so, uh, you know, naming, you know, human-like robots versus bird-like orbiters uh, might be a thing, but, um, yeah. So. Also, I think social media, Mer, uh, um, 
started kind of before the social media kick came on. So they didn't get nicknamed until way later. Cute nicknames. Cute nicknames, right. cosmic rays that basically blew that atmosphere away. And once that happened, liquid water wasn't stable on the surface of Mars anymore. It was too cold and, there, and, and the pressure was too low. And so now Mars is not capable of supporting liquid water and, and likely not capable. I'm wondering if any other school groups have joined so since you shouted time. out. If you um, are another school group or you're homeschooling or virtual schooling, pop your name in the comments and we'll shout you out. Thank you. Now sending it back over to you, Raquel. Thanks, Marina. Earlier, we were able to catch up with the communication systems engineer, Chloe Sackier. She helps us break down the system used to track perseverance during landing. The communications infrastructure supporting Perseverance's landing is quite complex. We've rallied a truly global network of relay and communications assets to help us capture and record those precious minutes of entry, descent, and landing, or EDL. We receive a stream of engineering telemetry via these communication assets that helps us see and understand exactly what's happening. Perseverance sends direct to earth X-band tones, each of which provides us with indications of critical entry, descent and landing events. During entry, descent and landing, we have two Mars orbiters listening for the ultra high frequency or UHF Emily signal here. from Perseverance. The states these orbiters relay these signals to the deep major. space network stations on Earth, Madrid in Spain and Goldstone in California. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter or MRO has reconfigured its software to perform a type of relay called bent pipe. This will provide us with near real time telemetry during entry, descent and landing. We have coverage from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter from just before entry to a few minutes after landing. The telemetry we receive will be delayed by the time it takes light to travel from Mars to us back on Earth. Additionally, the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution spacecraft, or MAVEN, is recording these UHF signals and will be relaying that recording hours after landing. MAVEN will be covering us from around the time of cruise stage separation until a few minutes after landing. We also receive what we call heartbeat tones, which are indications that the spacecraft is alive and progressing throughout entry, descent, and landing. It's important to note that while unexpected, we could lose our communication links and still land safely. Because Perseverance is doing entry, descent, and landing completely autonomously, she doesn't need our help to joystick the landing. The communication links give us added visibility. And you can see Chloe hard at work inside Mission Control awesome. right now. Perseverance's landing might look like the yes. system the Yes, if I were a student right now, I would be in jumping into planetary science and astrophysics again. Um, it's so exciting right now. <laughs> the fact that you could be that person who was just sitting in front of the computer. Oh, it's exciting. Nothing can be taken for granted when you get I think to Mars. every mission sends back more data than we've Space ever gotten from all the has other a missions. Way of throwing us curveballs and surprising us. I mean, until we get the data that says we're on the ground safely, I'm going to be worried that we're not going to make it. <laughs> Entry, descent, and landing is often referred to as the seven minutes of terror because it takes about seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere of Mars to the ground safely. The spacecraft has to do all of this by itself. There are many things that have to go right to get Perseverance onto the ground safely. There's a lot counting on this. This is the first leg of our sample return relay race. There's a lot of work on the line. Starting about 10 minutes before atmosphere entry, we get rid of Ooh. really the spacecraft part of, of the yeah, rover just... that's been supporting us. We come screaming in to the Martian atmosphere at 12 to 13,000 miles per hour. And the heat shield is what dissipates all that initial energy through friction. The vehicle will continue actually flying itself through the atmosphere. It's sort of like a transforming vehicle that went from spacecraft and now it's kind of like an aircraft actively guiding itself. When we're going slow enough, we deploy a parachute. It's the biggest supersonic parachute we've ever sent to another planet. It's critical for slowing down the vehicle. Perseverance's entry, descent, and landing borrows heavily from that of Curiosity. But fundamentally, Perseverance is a different rover. She's bigger, she has different instruments. We've added a lot of smarts on the inside to make it more capable so that it can deal with the landing site that we've given. 
the science team identified Jezero Crater as basically an ancient lake bed and one of the most promising places to look for evidence of ancient microbial life and to collect samples for future return to Earth. Uh, the problem is it's a much more hazardous place to land. When you look at Jezero, all you see is danger. How do we go to a site that we never thought was safe enough to go to before? So the heat shield, which has protected us all the way through entry, is no longer necessary. We need to get that off so that we can actually see the ground. And we can see the ground in a couple different ways. Perseverance will be the first mission to use terrain relative navigation. So while it's descending on the parachute, it will actually be taking images of the surface of Mars and determining where to go based on what it sees. This is finally like landing with your eyes open. But having this new technology really allows Perseverance to land in much more challenging terrain than Curiosity or any previous Mars mission could. Amongst the rocks and the craters and the cliffs, these things are hazardous to the rover, but these are the things that are interesting to the scientists. Once Perseverance has figured out where she is, jettison the back shell and parachute and light up our rockets. Those rockets help us steer to a safe landing spot that's nearby. That descent stage takes us all the way down to about 20 meters off the ground. That's when we start the sky cannon. Hi, Crane. Once the rover has hit the ground, the descent stage will close my from mind. The rover and fly away to a safe distance. But surviving that seven minutes is really just the beginning for Perseverance. What it's job right, being the first life Christ. example turn to go look for those signs of past life on Mars. All that can't start until we get Perseverance safely to the ground. And then that's when the real mission begins. And somebody in the chat was talking about the boarding passes that they uh, they had people sign up for. So some of you may have your names on this rover. Right? They were uh, etched in very small, small print there, but... Uh, but yeah, I, I signed up for a boarding pass. I think I sent one to my dad too. So. so when the aliens come to our solar system two, 20 million years from now and they find Earth as a barren wasteland and they go to Mars and they find the rover, they'll see my name on it. You were part of the Curiosity rover landing. But I'm excited for it. Does it get for. any easier the second time around? It absolutely does not, especially when considering we're trying to land the biggest, heaviest, most we have had some other built. questions about um, a fetch ever. rover and how the Jezero samples that they and, collect you know, with the Perseverance will be brought back to Earth. Earth. There's a cliff, cliff wall that's about 200 feet tall that runs right through Yeah, the so in terms of, of, of a Mars sample return, um, a later mission will essentially collect all the sample caches that Mars 2020 collects and drops off. Um, and so uh, the Fetch rover will essentially bring bring the samples to a rocket that gets sent uh, from the Martian surface to Mars orbit, essentially. And then um, the actual third and, and hopefully last part of, of the entire campaign is getting the samples from Martian orbit uh, back to Earth. So it's TBD on the second and third parts, but um, uh, in terms of Scarecrow land, those are the are the plans. How are they caching the samples from this one? Are they leaving them in the rover or are they putting them someplace? So um, in terms of having them, uh, uh, I think that, that, that there were originally two kind of strategies. One was essentially a parking lot, quote unquote, where mm -hmm. they get dropped off all to the same place. And so um, it's pretty dynamic, uh, I think, as time goes on, um, uh, whatever the safest... Uh, strategies would be to make sure you can actually find the samples later. I mean, Mars is a very dusty place. And so uh, when it comes down to being able to find something that you left there, uh, you know, potentially five, 10 years later down the road, um, it will be covered with dust. And so um, just having the ability to, uh, um, to know where you've left your samples uh, is important. So um, to be determined as time goes on. Right. So I do, uh, that, that fetch rover business is so interesting. Um, and, and then we will send a retrieval system to the orbit, which is easier than getting something off the ground, right? And then it will shoot itself back to earth after it grabs the samples. But I just wanna give a shout out to Utah again, not just because Great Salt Lake reminds us of this crater, but 
also because those samples are going to be plopped down in a pile of bubble wrap into uh, the West Desert of Utah. So <laughs> we get to receive the samples in Utah, which is kind of fun. Um, hey, Scott, somebody's asking how long will, will Perseverance remain operable? Do you know what the target time is? Oh, John so, said one year. But yeah, yeah the, the plan is 687 Earth days. So essentially two, two so, so, so one, one Martian year is about two, two Earth years. And so uh, that's, that's the, the, I guess, quote unquote, I guess kind of mission guarantee, but um, you can imagine how much longer that's going to last given, um, or at least you would hope uh, that it's going to last a lot longer than just two Earth years. So there's, there's essentially the prime mission where um, the main set of mission objectives are, are sought out to be solved and, and to be accomplished. And then what, what happens later on as we go into uh, different phases of, of the extended missions. And so that you're able to continue on in terms of doing work as time goes on, uh, kind of building upon the initial mission objectives. So um, for, for the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that I was on, um, we were in the fifth extended mission with the prime mission being uh, in 2008 or nine, I believe, I forgot when, when it started, but um, uh, these later extended missions actually help for a lot of good science to be done um, uh, as time goes on because you're constantly learning as we're moving forward. And so for from the orbiter standpoint, we're getting a lot more coverage of the planet from a rover standpoint, we're driving to new places, um, but there's always a trade-off between the science that you're doing currently where you're actually you know standing or at least are in terms of the rover, and then what goes on later on. And so uh, you have to assume that you'll never go back to the site that you came from. So as a field geologist and a field geobiologist, um, we have the luxury of going back to these sites whenever we, we want to, um, uh, given what we've learned. And so if, if, we, if we could not go back to the site later on, we have to make sure that we get all of the objectives and what we want to get done actually done before we leave, because we'll never come back to that specific site. So there's some questions that I, in the chat that I'm I'm always I always struggle to to answer about humans on Mars, um, you know uh, when when we plan to send people, and I don't know if NASA has any any more concrete plans than you know beyond the budget horizon, which has kind of always been the, <laughs> the thing that uh, that NASA has said about uh, humans. But but could we ever expect to to send uh, humans to Mars in a reasonable amount of time? That's, such a, that's yeah. an interesting question. I, I want to say one, one quick thing and then turn this over to Scott, who can probably um, has a little more insight to that. But um, in the field of genetics that I came out of, um, we finished the human ge genome sequencing 10 years earlier than anticipated because the private sector got involved. And then there became this competition between government entities and private sector. So I, I don't know if Elon Musk will be the first one, if SpaceX will be the first to um, send people to Mars, um, but the collaborations between the private sector and the public sector are really interesting to me. Scott, do you wanna comment on that? Are you thinking about it in terms of a timeline, Scott? I lost the window for a second, sorry. Um, so yeah, uh, in terms of collaboration and being able to, to move things forward at a much more, not efficient pace, but being able to not lose, I guess, the science fidelity as we move forward um, and still being able to do things in a, in a kind of reasonable uh, strategic space. Um, humans, in terms of being able to do uh, um, what we're doing in terms of sample return and actual analysis, having a human being at your field site is obviously something that, that is um, a lot more efficient, but also critical to understanding um, what the features are that you're looking for. So, um, so when it comes down to uh, um, that kind of collaboration and bringing that forward, um, it, 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 it does help uh, if you're able to keep in mind um, both the kind of strategic standpoint, but also um, the science you're looking to do on these sites. And so 
there's no obviously estimate in terms of uh, when there's obviously plans and, and, and the, the seeds have been planted in terms of human spaceflight. Um, uh, about, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, there was a human landing site workshop um, that the Lunar and Planetary Institute uh, ran, um, typically where we have the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. Um, and that was one of the first ones that essentially gave MRO, that's the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, specific global sites that had had certain human interests in terms of if we were to send humans, where would we land? And so, um, the biggest uh, you know process from that is being able to use the actual resources that are on the planet um, for humans in terms of us being able to get water from the Martian regolith uh, from from certain areas that you're able to you know, in terms of Moxie's whole experiment being able to understand how to actually produce oxygen. And so. Um, think of all the drama in terms of the Martian movie, uh, but in terms of actually having to plan all of that and how that actually works. And you, not that you run into issues, but in terms of uh, um, what's what's feasible in terms of budgets and time. And unfortunately, those are things we have to uh, uh, work within. Um, one of the, so I think one of the very first parts of that movie they had had some comment about 12 Martian orbiters around the planet monitoring dust storms. Um, at the time of that movie, we had two and yeah. they were 10 and 15 years old, which is fine. Things still worked, but, but in terms of, of what it takes to actually get uh, um, these assets into orbit to land safely and all of that. And, and, and the, and the people that actually work on, on these projects to have that knowledge, stay and remain in in these certain places to move these things forward um uh is 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 all critical to to have this go forward well and i should also point out, oh sorry rachel's got something she should yes <laughs> awesome i was just gonna say weber say actually already put people on mars there you go <laughs> here we are on the surface of mars so you want to tell them where that actually comes from? <laughs> um, yeah. So this uh, this photograph was from my Mars um, show that we shot uh, last summer or last spring before COVID, and this was actually us in the middle of the desert near Moab. Um, and these were our costumes we put together for our show. And these costumes, I, I'm sorry, but Smith and Ed's words was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the white jumpsuits are old military um, under covers i guess for that we got at smith and edwards no that's awesome no and it's funny because i you know when i think i i'm a big fan of this tv show the expanse i don't know if you've been watching that or read the books but uh you know i, I love that i'm not sure i'm not sure i understand why we want to go back into a gravity well once we get out of one you know like i don't I, i'm definitely team team belter you know i think we should go to the asteroid belt and uh and live there. So you're saying you don't want to terraform Mars? Well, I'm just, t t there will be people who can do that. They can do what they like. I, I'm going to the belt. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Let them terraform Mars in a, in a small little globe. And then there you go. Make, <laughs> make most of the planet, I guess, a national park so you don't touch it. Yep. <laughs> Uh, John told my class this week that he'd rather go to Venus so he could wear short sleeves. Yeah, seriously. I want to be on, I want to be in a respirator and a short sleeve shirt on the cloud city, dumping instruments over the side. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can go back inside for the piano bar and, you know, a little, little dancing uh, in the evening. Cause you'll be floating in the, yeah. You can keep all that dust. I'm not a, I'm not a fan. Goodness. No, my favorite thing about that show, The Expanse, is um, so someone was asking about timelines, and I think, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't. I mean, we could decide uh, that we're interested in doing all robotic exploration, and that's and that's probably a good thing, and we don't want to damage the environments of these places. Um, or we could all of a sudden this commercial space, space flight could take off and it just explodes. I don't know what's going to happen. But things can happen fast, I think, if they decide to. 
So Jeff asks, it'd be cool if we could grow potatoes on Mars. Agreed. I would like to bring a different fertilizer than what they used in the Martian. But, uh, changes what those those rocks are like. So being able to go to Mars and actually collect a sample where we know exactly where it came from and we know uh, we can preserve it and keep it pristine and carry it all the way back here, this will be incredibly important to help us answer questions about uh, the geologic history of Mars, uh, understanding how it formed and evolved, and also really important questions about whether or not life actually existed on Mars three and a half billion years ago, and whether that life, if it existed, has been preserved in the surface of Mars. Now, Lori, these sample tubes that Perseverance is going to be collecting, they're the cleanest things ever created on Earth. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, my goodness. We worked so hard. The team here at JPL is absolutely incredible to assure that those sample tubes are incredibly clean. One of the main goals of this mission is to be able to detect if there's actual life that's preserved, um, ancient life preserved in those rocks, in those samples. And we definitely don't want to be carrying, you know, our own DNA off to Mars and then bring it back here to confuse our, our scientists when they're trying to study those samples. So it, it is an incredibly clean uh, set of uh, equipment that's been sent there. As you said, the cleanest thing we've ever sent into space. Now, this is a very complicated campaign. Can you break down for us how it's going to work and if there's any international partners working with us? You are correct. The, the Mars sample return campaign is incredibly complex. In fact, it's probably the most challenging thing we've ever tried to do. Uh, but we're definitely not going to try and do it alone. Uh, we have great partners with the uh, European Space Agency. And the way this campaign is going to work, well, Perseverance is the first step. Chapter one uh, is going to Mars and collecting the samples. Chapter two is going to be a sample return lander that we hope to launch in around 26 to 28, 2026 to 2028. And that lander, uh, it'll be an American lander carrying uh, a fetch rover that's provided by European Space Agency. And that little fetch rover will drive out and pick up the samples that Perseverance left on the surface of Mars. And the fetch rover will bring them back and load them into uh, a rocket that we call the Mars Ascent Vehicle, which will be the first ever launch from another planet. Uh, and it will launch those samples into orbit around Mars. In the meantime, European Space Agency will have an orbiter that's in orbit around Mars that can rendezvous and capture those samples and then bring them back to Earth for, for us to study back here in our amazing laboratories. <laughs> A lot of firsts, it sounds like, Lori. And another first, how is Perseverance and the Mars Sample Return Mission going to help the future exploration, human exploration of Mars? I'm so glad you asked that. I think we're going to get a lot of great information from Mars Sample Return with, again, being able to land uh, the heaviest payload we've ever landed on Mars will be that sample return lander that's critical to us learning how to land humans on Mars. And then we are definitely going to want to be able to launch the humans back off of Mars. So that Mars Ascent vehicle is going to be critical, that, that first step of the first launch from another planet. So exciting, Lori. And speaking about the Mars generation, we're now going to take a student question for you from Livia. Hi, my name is Livia, and my question is, what made you want to study Mars, and why are you working so hard and willing um, to wait so long for a sample? Thank you. Oh, Olivia, that is such a great question. Um, and, and I enjoy Mars just because it can tell us so much about how our solar system formed and evolved. Um, all of the planets can tell us different parts of that story, and Mars is a really key piece of that. And one of the main reasons we're willing to wait so long to get the sample back is that we've got great new scientists that are all about your age and in about 10 or 15 or 20 years, you'll be the generation that's going to actually get to work with these samples. When, when they come back, you'll be the scientists and engineers that will, will be the, the next generation to, to change how we think about, uh, about Mars and how we think about life in the solar system. That was a great question, Lori. Reach for the stars, for little scientists and engineers. Yeah, Carson. So oh, sorry. Rachel, did you? Lori. 
our yeah do you do we want our panelists to answer that question too why are we so interested in studying mars and what's on mars and we're willing to wait for so long and moments ago they handed it over to the i think bonnie should take that one i i would love that um i I, uh, I think that it's worth the wait um, because sample return gives us an opportunity to use our laboratories, the whole scientific community um, and everything we have on earth that gives us the tools to do science. We don't have those things on, you know, we don't have those things on Mars. We don't have all of these amazing laboratories that we could, um, make use of. So sample return is worth waiting for because it's such an opportunity. Um, particularly, I'd love to see what's inside some of those salts. Okay. Um, I do want to just extend uh, my heartfelt appreciation from the EDL team to the, uh, to the launch crews team. I just got an email from my friend Kathleen Benison, who's at um, West Virginia University. She's going to be um, part of the science team. She's one of the scientists who will examine. Um, she's she's a salt, uh, sodium chloride and gypsum geologist, and she has studied microbes living in those crystals. So I'm excited that she's involved. You've done everything right. And you've put up with us too, right? You've put up with our eccentricity. There is a, there's a, a question in the Q&A, and I think John is answering it, but what do serious scientists think of the Pluto is a planet debate and I, I'm a serious scientist. <laughs> Ryan is giving a call out to Clyde Tumbo, who I think is an amazing human being. Um, do you want to answer that one, John? I would love to, because as I've already pointed out, I'm, I'm, I'm team asteroid belt, and I'm also team Kuiper belt and team Pluto. Um, I honestly think that the only reason that uh, the point of demoting Pluto from being one of the nine planets was to save fifth graders from having to memorize the thousand other Pluto-like planets out there. <laughs> I really do think that was the whole point. That is an uh, excellent that. point. That's no, it's serious, because it's such an arbitrary distinction. I mean, they talk about the, you know, a, the definition of a planet is that it has to clear its, it has to clear its orbital space. Well, Earth didn't clear its orbital space. We've got the moon, right? I mean, there are all these things that you could argue back and forth. Um, I think the, the reality is, as most serious planetary scientists recognize that it's a spectrum. I mean, if you took the moons of Jupiter and remove Jupiter, you would have four planets. Some of them are larger than our moon and, and even the size of Mercury, you know. So, so I think it's, you know, there are, there are moons of planets that are as big as some of our, our planets. So I think it's, it's kind of an arbitrary distinction. And, and it's one of those things that, you know, science is rarely done by, by, vo by vote. <laughs> and they basically voted on whether or not to make Pluto a planet. And so you had to make a decision one way or the other. Um, but I, I, for me, when I think of Clyde hanging out, uh, you know, taking those observations, oh, something just happened. What just happened? Everyone clapped. What did we miss? I think the, uh, one of the mission leads was just giving a pet, a pep talk. Oh, All okay. Right. All right. Anyway, so Pluto, so you can say a planet. Sure. But then you have to memorize all 1,000 other Kuiper Belt objects. EDL start anchor. Um, as I, was mentioning, I tell you what I love about it. I, I love so examples where that row. Um, the more we learn and the more we know in science, the more we change the way we look at things and classify things. And Pluto didn't change. Right. Pluto, right. Pluto is the what same it is. Yeah. object. Pluto doesn't care what you call it. Yeah. Um, so I just love that it's a great example of how science isn't static. You can't yeah. memorize science. No. So I, I think it's fantastic. And I always tell kids that when they ask me that. Yeah. Oh, and so somebody was asking about this other planet beyond Pluto, now the ninth planet. Um, you know, it's interesting the way we find planets that we can't see, right? You know, if you look out and, uh, you know, Pluto, Pluto is too faint for you to see with your naked eye or even with a telescope if you don't know where you're looking. So what we do is we look at the gravitational influence that the planets have on other planets. And so um, we originally were searching for a planet near Pluto or somewhere in that region because of gravitational anomalies with some of the other planets. It just so happened that 
they happened to pick up this object Pluto while they were doing that search. Um, and it was a while before we figured out how big Pluto was or how massive it was because those observations are difficult. Um, but people have looked at the distribution of orbits of planets. Um, or See, there I go using that word again. Orbits of objects out by Pluto, the Kuiper belt. And uh, they seem to have a distribution that indicates they might be uh, being jostled by some other gravitational body out there. And that's a completely legitimate hypothesis. And it would be impossible for us to rule out there being a massive planet out there simply from looking for it because it would be so faint that you'd, you'd have to know where to look before you'd find it. I mean, we'd have to, we don't have any survey instruments that are capable of finding objects that faint um, without you know, like we have Hubble Space Telescope, but it has a very narrow field of view and you have to go look directly at it. Um, that's about to change though. We've got an instrument, the Vera Rubin Telescope uh, is coming online and that's gonna be able to image uh, the entire sky to a relatively deep, uh, you know, very faint objects uh, a few times a week, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, but it, but frequently. So we're about to find a bunch of stuff moving on the night sky that we haven't seen before. And, and I would not be at all surprised to find out that the uh, elementary school students have a few more planets to memorize. Somebody's asking, will the James Webb telescope see it? James Webb telescope could see it if we knew where to look, right? That's the tricky part. So, um, you know, James Webb certainly is sensitive enough to see it. Um, but if you think about, you know, the sky, one thing that I find amazing about the night sky is that we've only taken a complete picture of the night sky maybe twice. And so if something, if you take a picture of something, everything just looks static. You have to come back and take a picture again to see something move. And so we could have very well taken a picture of one of these objects um, and then not gone back the next night to look again. And you, so you wouldn't know that it was, that, it, that something had moved. So it's actually a very hard uh, measurement to make. And in fact, uh, some of the things that we're, you know, we're try still trying to count the number of nearby stars, uh, because if a star is sufficiently dim, like a very, very low mass star, we might not have seen it yet because uh, we haven't pan the sky with a sensitive enough instrument because um, James Webb is not it will not look at the entire sky Hubble has not looked at the entire sky uh, Vera Rubin telescope will look at pretty much the entire sky so I'm excited about that awesome yeah, something that, you know, when I think about the, the reason I would become an astronomer today if I wasn't one already um, is the, the just the miraculous things that are happening in observation. So my entire career has almost entirely been, you know, driven by modeling gravitational waves, modeling exoplanets, modeling dark matter, modeling all these things because we didn't have the instruments to detect any of this stuff. And now we have gravitational wave observatories. We're building telescopes that will be able to te detect planets around other stars and measure their light. We're sending rovers to nearby planets that can drive themselves around and hunt and sample uh, stuff that we can return to Earth laboratories. Um, we've seen pictures of the surface of Pluto. Uh, there's even somebody who has this crazy idea of sending a small camera to Alpha Centauri, right? Um, so there's, there's, uh, it's a cool time to be getting into space exploration. We love getting all your pictures out there. We've gotten a lot of artwork from kids, which has been- Even if I don't get to go to Mars in person. What do you think about the microphones that are gonna be on Perseverance? What I am so excited about those. Yes. <laughs> Talk about those. <laughs> Great. What will we hear, John? Wind. <laughs> but this is what I love about NASA. We don't know what we're going to hear. Thank you so much. Right? I mean, this is the thing I love about exploration that, you know, you put the instrument out there because you don't know uh, what you're going to hear. I, I, I have a story. So our Weber State University has one of these high altitude balloon programs where students can uh, build instrumentation and they tie them to a helium balloon and we send it into near space. And the students are always coming up with ideas to measure stuff and they don't know, uh, you know, they, they don't even they don't even have a reason for why they want to do it. You know, somebody, for example, they said, hey, why don't we have the camera pointing up at the balloon instead of down at the ground? And I'm thinking, why would you do that? 
you're trying to take observations of the ground, but we got these really cool videos of balloons exploding at 100,000 feet that showed some really interesting things. Uh, somebody sent a, uh, a voice recorder up to measure the sound. And the funny thing was, is they duct taped it to the top of the instrument stack. And when it got up to high altitude, the, the duct tape failed because it was not low temperature uh, adhesive. And the, uh, the, the microphone fell off and plummeted to earth at uh, terminal velocity. And so it's out there in Vernal right now, probably in a cow patty, you know. <laughs> so if anybody ever finds it, all you'll hear is you know, as it just about hit hit a cow right before it hit the ground. But uh, but I don't know. You know, maybe Scott can answer what the. I'm sure I'm sure someone had to justify at some point the cost of putting a microphone on the rover. But I I don't I think it's just because we we've never done it before. Yes, yeah, so there there are a lot of things uh, when it comes down to to the payload and and what we're able to uh, to meet and then add things on to later. Um, but something as simple as, as the whole L blue dot, you know, of that whole campaign of being able just to flip the spacecraft around and point back to Earth. Um, when you're in the moment, the kind of emergent behavior that comes out from having the ability and, and going someplace brand new, um, your whole thought process on, on what we can do and, and it would be cool if dot, 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 you know? Um, but the content of, of, of the, of, what that means both for, for actual science, but being able to engage everybody, you know, everyone, everyone's able to, to really appreciate um, what it would sound like in terms of landing on Mars. And so it's something that uh, it helps take a step back from, from what you are potentially having tunnel vision in and, uh, and thinking about um, uh, I guess the value of this, that, that is science and then other, other um, I guess human interest as well, so. I have a question for Bonnie and Scott and John, and I think all of our panelists. Um, we are a very diverse panel. I'm a biologist. I got started on this because Scott asked me to go out to Great Salt Lake and take some scoops of mud and salt, and mostly I study bugs and birds, but. There's a lot of um, uh, careers in space sciences, and maybe you could talk about those for the young people that are here that are really excited to see this landing. You can pose next to the rover. I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I, I'm currently teaching astrobiology, and I'm also teaching um, geobiology of the universe. Um, I'm a biologist. Um, who didn't have training in space science or geology. Um, and the coolest thing about the best science that's going on right now is that it's interdisciplinary. And the, this old idea that science lives in separate silos and separate departments and separate buildings needs to go away. Um, and so I, I think that um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of roles to be played in understanding, particularly if we're asking questions about life. A, an astronomer can't ask questions about life without talking to people who work in life sciences. And a life sciences person can't do that, think about life in rocks without talking to a geologist. And there's just so many. And I think you can probably tell that computer science is also playing an enormous role in this mission, right? And engineering, and you know, it's so much on the table. So that's the thing I get the most excited about. What about you guys? Well, I, so I was part of the University of Washington's astrobiology program back in the late 90s when it was first getting off the ground. And uh, I remember, you know, we got a big grant to do this interdisciplinary project. And when the when the people came to talk to us about this grant, they we talked about what Bonnie was just saying about how we wanted to work with other disciplines and wanted to talk to all these things. And one of the one of the scientists on that panel said, "Well, you're never going to get a job where you get to work with other scientists in different fields. I mean, when you study astronomy, you'll be an astronomer. When you study physics, you'll be a physicist." And that turned out to totally not be true. <laughs> I mean. The 
this is not true at all. And it was interesting to see this, you know, this change. And I remember as a graduate student, it was, the, you know, when we first started kind of crossing boundaries, there was a lot of pushback because, you know, there's some institutional, like budgets are set by department and set by college and, and resources are scarce. So people, you know, argue over who gets the money to do what. And so, you know, and, but the mentality is changing. I mean, we just passed, um, or I should say, we just started a bunch of new programs at Weber State University that are not only interdisciplinary within the College of Science, but are interdisciplinary across the entire university. Um, things like environmental studies and environmental sciences and, and stuff like this, that's, that, uh, that we do it because the students are interested and we do it because employers are interested um, in it. And we do it because the questions and the problems we're trying to solve require that we do it. I mean, there's no such thing as physics and chemistry. There's the universe. And up until now, physicists had looked at it one way and chemists looked at it another way. But there really isn't, you know, a distinction <laughs> between those two fields, uh, especially now that we're working on materials science and materials characterization and, and new things. So, yeah, if, if it's up to me, you know, there, this whole idea of scientific disciplines, which is completely arbitrary and historical, uh, will go away. Um, so I'm, I'm proud to have been a part of that. Profile will do a maneuver called heading line. That said, study physics, it's the best. Because I have to say that, right, Bonnie? I guess so. <laughs> I always tease my chemistry students. I say around here we pronounce that physics, but um, <laughs> but I'm honestly kidding. You know, at at Weber State University, and this is not a joke. We have three biology programs at Weber State University, and they are all distinct and awesome and amazing. Um, it's very rare to have that many biology programs, but they all have a different focus, and it's spectacular. Um, and I don't see anything wrong with having you know, that type, you know, some people more interested in microbiology or zoology, but at the same time, those groups work together really well. Um, so, it, so I think it's, it's kind of fun. Maybe, maybe we should think of disciplines more like, you know, sports teams, you know, it's fun to have a little rivalry and stuff like that, but otherwise we're really all playing the same game. So I have actually absolutely always hated sports metaphors. I think <laughs> I'm not a sports person. Like they always go over my head and sometimes being the only woman in a room, it felt like it was a language that I didn't understand. Not that they're not female sports aficionados, but. See, I was I, thinking about horseback riding. <laughs> yeah, I know. you. <laughs> I, I absolutely hate sports metaphors and I don't like the competition between departments. I like collaboration and synergy. So yeah. I'm going to push back on that. I, <laughs> I hear you. I, I don't, I agree with this. I agree I don't with think this. we should be choosing a team. I think we should, be, we should, we should all be passing the ball to each other, <laughs> whatever sports <laughs> ball it is. Whatever sports <laughs> ball. I might, I, I, I think we agree. Right. <laughs> team collaboration. For them as I'm really be, lucky to, to work with the colleagues that I work with because they, they uh, honestly being, we're, we're still small enough that we're in a one big building with all of the sciences. And I think that really, that really helps. Agreed. Agreed. Um, we, us too. And I, I think it's uh, phenomenal how much cross disciplinary work that reads, just being in proximity. So we, we just got a question in the chat. This is, this would be a good question for, um, for my planetarium staff, because they've probably been reading a lot of these. So it says, what books would you recommend for information about Mars, rovers, etc.? I'm a mom with our kids doing online school, and I'd love to get fun books for elementary and young adult ages. And Weber State Science alum. Awesome. Can you think of any fun Mars books? Well, Jamie's been doing a little work with um, her daughter Cora's class. Jamie, have you come across any books that are appropriate for elementary kids? You know, we've really been doing uh, more of watching of the NASA videos um, because they're just so wonderful and short. I don't have any good answers. Uh, Jamie and I did write a book on Great Salt Lake, but uh, for children, but we did not write one on on Mars. Maybe that's next, Jamie. So I was just looking online. There's um, there was a, a little while ago there was a book on um, the Hiker's Guide to Mars. Um, maybe they've updated this, but if you do a Google search on that, they they had uh, you know 
orbital images and then they kind of mapped out kind of like you see the Utah best 100 hikes kind of thing. Um, and that was fun. I liked that when I was, um, I, I mean, I've, I'm always, I'm always reading kids books because I, I'm a big kid. <laughs> so that was fun uh, to look at. Um, you know, I was thinking about, um, you know, let's see here. Books about Mars rovers. I'm going to let me do a little research on that while we're waiting here and I'll see what I can find. Okay, so we just got another question here. And question is, if we find evidence of past life or habitable environments on Mars, what's the implication? I, I love this question because as Bonnie points out, there's, there's habitable and inhabited. I think if we find environments on Mars that are habitable and used to be inhabited but are no longer inhabited versus environments which are habitable and never inhabited, or environments that are habitable and still inhabited, those three have very interesting implications. Scott and I, um, Scott talked me into going to a meeting last year on extant life. Maybe that was actually the year before we've lost a year. Um, and, and what extant life means is existing life. And the question on the table was, you know, where are the best places to go on Mars to look for existing life? But I think both Scott and I are equally excited about extinct life, and that's what you're pointing to. Um, I, I uh, have published on biological molecules in ancient salt, and I'm really interested in these biosignatures. Um, we, we found DNA, we found cellulose in this Permian 250 million year old salt. And Scott has ideas about um, maybe even lipids and other biological molecules. So I'll turn it over to you, Scott. But I think those, those signatures um, would be equally exciting. And the question is, what are the implications of that? So if you find a molecule that we know on earth can only be made by life, that is, to me, just as exciting as finding something that's currently alive. Yeah, so in terms of both extinct versus extant life, the, the ability to distinguish between the two, obviously, is, is huge when it comes down to actually validating that it is ancient life that has survived versus contamination. But it's obviously a lot easier if you have extant communities life that's actually present now, because um, you'd have a, um, I guess hopefully, a um, a much higher abundance of of that kind of evidence versus if you were to just look for ancient biosignatures and so um having the ability to both validate that it is indeed what you're looking at and then also that it is something that's that that's part of the actual sample or site that you're looking at it hasn't been transferred from earth um are, are two huge things um uh assuming you're able to to you know check off I guess, both of those very large boxes um separating out uh, how you'd validate what it is and being able to understand the kind of ecology outside of Earth's tree of life, essentially. And so it's something that, that's, that's the whole life as we know it versus life as we don't know it kind of feature. And so where, or at least how, how far back in, in Earth's evolution in terms of life on our planet um, should we think of life outside of Earth? And so um, it's, it's something where you have to take into account the ecology as well as, as both the mineral microbial interactions um, and, and, and just the evolution of life outside of Earth. And so if, if that was the case, um, how would you be able to determine where that evolution is currently and where it was prior? We are coming upon stage separation in so for the person that I was, uh, I think it was Carla was asking about books. Um, I found a couple of books. Buzz Aldrin has an illustrated guide to Mars called Welcome, uh, Welcome Mars Making Planet or Making Mars a, Your Planetary Home. And I sent a link to that in her, in her answer there. Um, and I found another book called You Were the First Kid on Mars, which sounds cool. And then a, a friend of mine from, uh, from Philadelphia uh, it says that Nat Geo Kids has an excellent book on Mars called Also I Am Mars, the book about Mars for kids. Uh, and she is an elementary reading specialist. So um, that's a good uh, good place to start there. So we're to, I just need to do a time check. Uh, it is uh, one thirty seven. Jamie, how are we doing on NASA TV here? Oh, I just paused them. Now they're okay. live again. 
I see them getting uh, a minute and a half from the yeah. state separation, about 11 minutes, 20 seconds from entry interface. Okay, so it's about 10 minutes from cruise state separation till entering the top of the atmosphere. From then on and out, things happen We're fast. We are switching to MFSK tones. Telemetry will have stopped. Telecom is confirming that the spacecraft has switched to broadcasting tones. These tones are received directly from Perseverance, but have very limited information content. We won't receive real-time information until about uh, nine, ten minutes from now, once the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter starts relaying information from Perseverance. We are under a minute from cruise stage separation, about ten and a half minutes from entry interface. It's getting exciting. I have to admit, I am quite anxious, uh, but very hopeful that this machine is going to do what we asked it to do. We are seeing the heartbeat tones. Okay, that means that, we've, that there's no more ones and zeros coming. It's just the vehicle telling us it's still alive. We are continuing to receive tones from Perseverance, coming standing by for cruise stage separation. Did they say 10 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I did want to say something about Scott's life as you do not know it. Um, I we have indication uh, that cruise stage oh. separation has been confirmed by the spacecraft. Oh, never mind. This is more exciting. <laughs> We're off on a good start. In about one minute, Perseverance's landing software will wake up and begin the final preparations for entry. The first action it will do is to fire warm-up pulses with its entry thrusters. These pulses ensure that the spacecraft gets the thrust that it wants during entry interface. We are about nine minutes from entry interface. Woo! Okay, so now the vehicle's on its own. It's, gonna, it's turning itself into the direction of facing the heat shield toward Mars, and, uh, and we'll eventually uh, uh, hang the top of the atmosphere. We're not far away. This is going to go very quickly from here on out. Chris uh, LeClues is asking about the lag time. Um, uh, Chris, let, let's That's ask John and John, that, uh, what's the lag time? By the crew stage, uh, as it it's about seven light minutes, through our so the 14 light minutes for two, for, for for a two way, so indicated, actually, um, we could what we're seeing is about seven and a half stage light minutes uh, or the the minutes delayed. Capsule and, um, so we saw a little and so the round trip is about 14 uh, light minutes. The data stream indicated So does that mean what we're seeing happened 14 minutes ago? We have confirmation that the vehicle has started warming up those entry thrusters. Warm pulses have begun. So, so, so we have a delay. Yeah. So so it's about seven minutes. So we have a delay um, in terms of what what's happened. So we're getting information back. So uh, to get a full point, confirmation, the spacecraft you know, two ways, about to stop light its spin from or, the cruise two revolutions per minute down to zero, and then we'll turn to its desired orientation from entry. It will se separate the two balance masks that have kept it balanced during all of cruise. This will allow the entry capsule to have lift when it enters the atmosphere. We have confirmation that the aircraft has turned to the desired entry attitude. We are about seven and a half minutes from entry interface. Okay. So that means it's is just entering in the now? Right direction. The thrusters are warmed up and doing their job. And now we've, we've spun down from the two revolutions per minute that the vehicle had the whole way to, uh, the way to Mars as a spin stabilized spacecraft. And then from here on out, it's going to just be a bullet and can, can control its orient orientation and attitude via rockets on the back of the back shell. points carrier lock. Uh, sorry, come around. The DTE from uh, Radio Science from uh, Green Bank reports carrier lock. You see the carrier on the downlink. Flight level one. We are continuing to wait for entry interface. We're about six minutes and 45 seconds from entry interface. We have confirmation from uh, Greenback that they are receiving direct to Earth telemetry via that path. The 
spacecraft Perseverance is currently transmitting heartbeat tones. These tones indicate that Perseverance is operating normally and has nothing significant to report. This is as expected. We're currently just over six minutes from entry interface. Does anybody have a favorite song about Mars? Um, Ryan says he's um, a David Bowie life on Mars. Okay. And now we that wait. Whole, that <laughs> whole album, the whole album is about Mars. All right. Can I say album? Do people know what an album is? Yeah, yeah we know what an album is. I'm sorry. I know what an album is. It won't be very long before. The, the, the atmosphere will start getting thicker and thicker. It's going very quickly at a, at a fairly steep angle of 15 degrees uh, into the atmosphere. And as it starts to slow We're down. just under uh, about five and a half minutes from entry interface. We're still receiving heartbeat tones. Uh, we expect to continue receiving heartbeat tones until about five minutes after entry. At that time, Perseverance will be no longer in view of our antennas here on Earth. About 90 seconds prior to entry, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter should begin receiving telemetry from Perseverance and streaming it to Earth in near real time. Uh, there are a few expected short outages, such as when we have a plasma backout or when we enter the peak heating phase. Aside from these outages caused by the plasma blackout, antenna switching, or high dynamic events, spacecraft events, we should have telemetry until about 90 seconds after landing. Uh, a plasma blackout is when the signal from Perseverance isn't strong enough to make it through the superheated, super fast air flowing around the spacecraft all the way down to Earth. Once the temperature drops below that peak heating, we do reacquire the signal from Perseverance. We are currently about four and a half minutes from entry interface. Perseverance continues to report heartbeat tones, indicating everything is nominal. Okay, what, we wait, what we're looking for now is we're, uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter should be in view soon of our vehicle and be able to listen to ones and zeros coming from a separate radio that's really designed to talk between spacecraft. It, Camera it, reports the electro radio is powered on, ready to receive signals from the lander. Okay, MRO is ready and, listen, and able and waiting for the, to hear from our rover. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has reported that it's ready to receive the signals from Perseverance. It should be in a few minutes here. We're just Flight local minutes one. from entry interface. We don't need these ones and zeros, as Swati said, um, but to land safely. But we, we really need it for our own uh, health and well-being today to keep our nerves in control. But. Around this time, a second spacecraft, MAVEN, should begin picking up telemetry from Perseverance and we'll continue to record that telemetry until several minutes post landing. We won't get that data for several hours after landing as it's being recorded and then will be forwarded to Earth later. We are continuing to receive heartbeat tones indicating that everything is nominal. We're currently at about three minutes until entry interface. Okay. I just heard that Miss Arnold's class at Doxy Elementary showed up. Very soon okay. we'll be getting ones and zeros, I hope, from our radio on the rover. The entry interface is nothing more than just an arbitrary place in the sky that we've defined to be above the atmosphere. But, th but from that point on, uh, there's definitely uh, atmosphere and above it there isn't there are two minutes from entry interface perseverance is to transmit heartbeat tones indicating everything is nominal so the tones can tell us whether something is bad or not is happening so so far the heartbeat is, is doing well so the vehicle thinks it's how it's uh, in good shape to land which is a great sign Uh. We're just under two minutes from entry interface. As it gets closer to Mars, Perseverance is actually being pulled in by Hi, Nibley Elementary. By the time Perseverance reaches entry interface point, she should be going just under 5.4 kilometers per second. We're at about 90 seconds from entry interface. 
and standing by for Marja Constance Orbiter to pick up the telemetry. Just astronomy is watching this. We are one minute from entry interface. MROs are in receive mode. We have confirmation that the Marshall Condensense Orbiter is now relaying data from Perseverance. We're about 30 seconds from entry interface. Perseverance is going about 5.2 kilometers per second and is about 190 kilometers altitude above the surface of Mars. Confirm your UHF data flow. About seconds from entry interface. 5.3 kilometers per second and an altitude of uh, 150 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. The spacecraft is now waiting until it begins feeling the atmosphere of Mars to slow it down. Once there is enough atmosphere, it will start controlling its path to the landing target. Navigation is also confirming that we can see a little bit of that slowdown of the atmosphere on the Perseverance entry capsule. Our current velocity is about 5.36 kilometers per second and an altitude of about 67 kilometers from the surface. We are probably seeing MRO plasma blackout at this point. Vehicle should be doing its turns right now. Hammer has lost lock. Perseverance. We have indications that Perseverance is now performing bank reversals in the atmosphere. These are the steps in order to control its distance to the landing target. Uh, Perseverance has just passed through the point of maximum deceleration and has indicated that it felt approximately 10 Earth Gs of deceleration. MRO has lock again. Yes, 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 yes. We saw a small outage uh, of the UHF telemetry from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter during that peak heating phase likely caused by the plasma blackout. Perseverance is still continuing to perform bank reversals in the atmosphere to control its distance to the landing target. Perseverance is going about one kilometer per second at an altitude of about 16 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have entered heading alignment which means Perseverance is no longer trying to control the distance to Mars, but in, to the target on Mars, but instead is flying straight to the target.
Our current velocity is about 550 meters per second at an altitude of about 15 kilometers from the surface. MRO is reporting good telemetry log. We are coming upon the straighten up. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver, where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Yes. 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 The navigation yes. has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Yes. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Yes. Perseverance yes. Yes. now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 yes. .6 kilometers of the surface. Right. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. We have priming of the landing engines. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. We've lost direct to earth tones. As expected, as expected. Sky crane maneuver has started about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from M MRO. UHF is good. Touchdown yeah. confirmed. Yeah. Perseverance yeah. safely. Yeah. Yeah. Ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. <laughs> Heck yeah. Good. Woo! <laughs> At this point, the descent stage has flown away to a safe distance. Perseverance is continuing to transmit. <laughs> no handshakes, no hugs. Oh, it's off. Orbiter to Earth. <laughs> When do we get pictures? When do we get pictures? My watch just told me to breathe. <laughs> yes. All right, all stations. Uh, we got it. Touchdown. We're, we're going to wait for the images. I, uh, 
This is so exciting. Uh, the team is beside themselves. It's, oh, it's, it's so surreal. Stay tuned. We might get some pictures. Be great. <laughs> so much has been riding on this we needed that yeah. yeah we just heard the news that perseverance is alive on the surface of mars yeah. it's not uh not the flight flight we have seen the completion of edl 3000 copy activity that is as expected So did they say we might be getting We've just heard the yeah. news that Perseverance is alive yeah. on the surface of Mars. Yeah, thumbnails might be coming down. We have to wait. And looks like we have some more news in. It looks like we're getting the first image. The first picture. Here, take a look at the first image. Flight, this is OL3. I have uh, the target point on the map when you are ready. We are ready, OL3. Go for it. Flight, I'll be uh, moving in, showing you the safe zone that we've landed in. <laughs> there it is. Just the first image from Perseverance on the surface of Mars. Now it comes from the engineering cameras, known as the hazard camera. Uh, this camera is mainly used to help the rover drive safely around Mars, and we will get higher resolution photos later in the day. Woo! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda says, let's go mountain biking. Looks like perfect, perfect conditions. <laughs> yeah. Whew, wow. I'm always surprised at how emotional that is. <laughs> I, I think I need to go change my overdress, my perseverance dress now. <laughs> <laughs> you were supposed to wear the, the astronaut pants. Yeah, I know, but see, I had I had curiosity and, and <laughs> opportunity on my dress. Now I got to go put perseverance on. Now that it's landed, <laughs> there you go. That's spectacular. <laughs> Looks like Mars. Look at that. Hey Scott, it didn't seem like there was a ton of dust that it billowed up around it. I thought there would be more dust. <laughs> There is or there isn't. We've got our second image in. Our second like image a lot of is in. Okay, this, these, these, we have a camera in the front and out rear of the, of the, of the spacecraft. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, they're near the ground, so these are pretty close. You can see the wheels there. Uh, and, 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 the, and they're a little dirty because we've got uh, glass covers over these, these cameras. But uh, we took these seconds after landing, so, so they're still dust in the air from our landing event. Uh, so this is this is happening. Um, uh, you know, this happened just seconds ago. Just arrived, and uh, this is really amazing. And, and uh, we even know where we landed. Uh, this is the most amazing thing. The vehicle has told us where, where it's landed because it knew, figured it out. You know, this is a sign. NASA works. NASA works. <laughs> You're when we darn put right. Together and our hands together and our brains together. You're darn tootin'. We can succeed. This is what NASA does. This is what we can do as a country on all of the problems we, we have, we need to work together to do these kinds of things and here make you, success here. happen. Yeah. 
This is the best, the best, the best. And joining us now is the acting administrator of NASA, Steve Jurisic. Steve, welcome and congratulations. Hey, thank you. What an amazing day. It, how does it feel to have another rover on Mars? Uh, it, it's amazing um, uh, to have perseverance, joy, and curiosity on Mars. And what a, what a just a credit to the team. I mean, just what an amazing team um, to work through all the adversity um, that goes and all the challenges that go with landing a rover on Mars, <laughs> plus the challenges of COVID and, um, and just an amazing accomplishment. And what does this mean for NASA and its future plans? So for robotic exploration, you know, every time we um, execute a mission with new instruments, we discover new things and things we never thought we would discover. So that's, that always informs our future robotic missions, uh, both landers, rovers, and orbiters. Um, this mission also has technology on it. One of the cool things is the Ingenuity helicopter. Um, it's, a, it's an experiment on this mission, but if it's successful, we can use it as an observation, science observation platform by putting instruments on it, and also use it as a scout um, for future rover missions. And, uh, and then just the entry, set, and landing um, capability. Um, it'll allow us to land more and more larger, more ambitious robots on the surface of Mars. And then for human exploration, um, we have the Medley, Med, uh, Mars Entry Set and Landing Instrumentation, which is going to give us EDL information. Um, we have the Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer. It's going to give us uh, properties, size and properties of dust particles, because when, when we send people, we're going to have to deal with that dust. Um, and uh, just, it's just, this is just an incredible mission because of the science and the technology, and then caching samples for a Mars sample return mission. That will be a, an amazing mission, the first round trip to Mars and back, and bringing those samples cached by Perseverance back to Earth to examine with state-of-the-art um, equipment in our laboratories here on Earth. We have so much to look forward to. And we also have a student question coming in from Landon. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Landon Applegate. I'm in sixth grade and I'm going to Academy for Academic Excellence. And my question is, do you think we could get resources from Mars to help on future missions or even as like a launching point? Great question, Landon. Actually, we have an experiment called the, Mox the Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization Experiment or MOXIE, and it's gonna gem demonstrate generating oxygen from atmospheric CO2 and that could help gener uh, develop, you know, uh, generate breathable oxygen and even if we can liquefy it, oxidizer for propulsion systems. So that's a tech demo on perseverance. And then we're gonna continue to characterize the frozen water on and below the surface of Mars and eventually try to figure out how to extract that water from the Martian soil or what we call regolith and then we can use that for potable water and also break it down into oxygen and hydrogen for rocket fuel. So absolutely, we're gonna to try to eventually figure out how to live off the land to support human missions to Mars. So Jamie, it looks like folks are having to head out. So thank I just you. wanna thank everybody for coming. And now um, that Perseverance has safely- Thanks for sharing this with us, Mars. it's amazing. So Let's learn more about what's in store I'm gonna stick for around and watch this for a little bit, Joining but thank you all for coming. Surface well, Mission for Manager, coming. Jessica Interest. Samuels. So really amazing. Jessica, your Surface Operations team questions. has now Read taken it. so over. awesome, thank you. What are they doing yeah. now? Yeah, I do know, I think that Wasatch Elementary so might stay on a little bit later. Did Wasatch Elementary ever end up making uh, it? The team not. will do a handover with the entry, descent, and landing team and uh, uh, pass any critical information. I can stick around a little and bit if there's folks who want to, uh, to answer questions. And safety assessments daily as we progress on this mission. And what do the upcoming weeks look like for your team? So as we enter Mars time now, uh, 
The commanding team will be working overnight while the rover is asleep so that uh, we can perform the initial checkouts of our key rover functions and our science instruments. And we have to do this all in time for the regularly scheduled communication pass. Uh, I have a question from a uh, fifth so grader. How did the rocket uh, not run out of sure fuel? That, uh, perseverance is healthy and um, we will begin this exciting adventure. Ed. So, so there was enough fuel uh, on the rocket to begin with um, to last the entire journey and then separate rockets for when we landed. Um, so there was enough fuel capacity for both. The rover wakes up at the same time every day, but on Earth, that's 40 minutes later. So the team is going to be shifting our work schedule. By so someone was asking in the chat when the recordings are going to be sent back because they want to they want to set them to some beats, which I think is awesome. And, uh, and so I don't know when the I don't know when they're coming down, but uh, but I think you should totally set them to beats when they do. Wait, how much fuel does it take to get to Mars? Does anybody know that question? The answer to that question. So the I mean the the amount of fuel depends on a lot of things like how big the rover is and things like that. So we usually talk about the the in orbital dynamics we talk about the change in velocity you need to get from one planet to another. Uh, so you calculate you calculate how much you have to change your velocity to go from where the Earth is in, in space to where Mars is in space, using the gravitational field to assist you when possible. Um, but in terms of the total amount, it really depends. The bigger the vehicle, uh, the the more fuel. I will say that something like ninety percent or more of what's in the rocket when we send it up is fuel so you really launch using all that fuel to launch fuel into space so that you can have fuel when you get out of the earth's gravitational pull cool um and how do they launch the rover this has anybody ever played kerbal space program <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, but now we, now I need to. <laughs> yeah. No, if you have access to Kerbal Space Program, you can download a replica of the Delta Five. Is it Delta Five? I think it's Delta. No. Is it Delta oh. Five, Scott? I can't remember. Uh, I, I think it was Atlas Five. Atlas. Yeah. Anyway, you can download a a a, a replica of this, and and go through the whole launch sequence. But uh, but they launch it on a rocket like uh, like we do everything else, um, and most of that rocket is to get it out of the Earth's orbit and on the way to Mars. And then, uh, and then this craft used the atmosphere to slow itself down. So it didn't use any fuel to slow itself down once it got to Mars. It, uh, it, it basically used the air braking from the atmosphere to do that. So in, in some ways, it's actually harder to get to the moon than it is to get to Mars because you don't have an atmosphere to slow you down when you get there. So you, need, uh, you don't need quite as much fuel because of the, the your, it's you know, because of the orbital thing, but uh, in terms of getting to the surface can be pretty hard. Um, and what about the atmosphere? Um, some of the fifth graders that we work with are curious about the atmosphere and the parachute. How did they figure out the resistance needed? Yeah, Scott, I had a question about that because you can't really test that in, I mean, you can't test a little league size parachute in, on earth in Mars conditions. <laughs> Well, so, so there is a chamber um, uh, that essentially is devoted to simulating um, of the Martian atmosphere, not, not the full atmosphere, but in terms of the actual pressures uh, um, and then airflow essentially. So the, uh, the actual thin, thin composition of, of, the, of the modern Mars atmosphere um, fully dictates the actual parachute uh, length and size and um and and the whole dynamics that you're able to to actually use and so um it definitely goes through um that kind of testing and so uh tests are done and essentially certain adjustments are made uh to the parachute but but as john mentioned uh, the mass of the actual object that that the parachute is helping land uh is the most direct relationship to, to the size of the parachute that you need so how is the rover powered? So, uh, um, I, so in terms of solar power from uh, uh, from from the original Mer rovers back in two thousand four, we, we we've essentially um, has promoted the power system to to having um, a certain batteries that that are um, uh, that are charged via a a nuclear source, and so. 
um, you have the batteries charged overnight, but but you can do work during the actual evening times and night times um, without solar power. And so uh, that helps uh, ice longevity of the power system on the rover. And so um, if you think of rechargeable batteries that you plug into your wall, but instead of it being an outlet, we have a nuclear source that's able to uh, to charge those batteries. So. Um, we noticed some some fifth graders noticed that the pictures look black and white. Why are they black yeah. and white? Yeah, so um, they are black and white uh, in terms of the uh, the full resolution of the photographs versus um, so essentially thumbnails versus full full photographs. And so you can imagine that it's much easier to send smaller amounts of data um, from from Mars back to Earth. And so the the the, the kind of swiftness that we got those first photos, um, you know, probably a few minutes after we landed, it's 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 much easier to send back a thumbnail that you're able to be safe on the surface versus the large scale images. Um, the the actual cameras themselves, uh, the the mass cam Z or essentially masked camera um, on this rover uh, can take full color images and and very high resolution images of that. And so those will all be in color, but you have the option to do color versus not. So it depends on what you're looking for. Let's see, we have so many questions now. Um, from Nibley Elementary, how did the scientists test the designs of their rover? Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Yeah, so it's a very long process um, that starts years and years prior. Um, so essentially you, you make your instruments designed, or at least you actually propose your instruments designed uh, for the actual science mission objectives. And so the testing of all the instruments independently from 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 each other, and then eventually on the rover itself, um, you have certain constraints where you have to uh, keep in mind that the instruments have to be a certain size and have to have a certain power and mass. And so the culmination of all of that together on the rover ends up being something that is your kind of total constraint for the vehicle. And so you can imagine if you were to to tow something, let's say you want to tow a tractor, um, you you'd not use a small car to tow a tractor. Um, you'd want to use something a lot bigger that has the power to tow that tractor or tow whatever you need to. So, um, knowing what we want to investigate on the planet allows us to work backwards to understand um, which instruments we'd want to propose and use. Did any rovers um, fail while they were landing? And I guess I would also add, were any mistakes, did any mistakes happen? And I'm thinking specifically about that whole wheel issue, Scott. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, in terms of, of, uh, of being able to, uh, yeah, so, so the wheel issue that, that you mentioned was from the Spirit Rover. And so um, it was able to uh, essentially, so, so one of the six wheels, this is, this is going back to 2004, 2005, um, one of the wheels ended up not being able to uh, to turn as well as the others, and so um, it led to the wheel essentially being static, not 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 actually turning at all. Um, and so, if you would imagine the Martian environment uh, is very similar to to um, uh, to certain sand grades on a beach, and so if you were to drive a car on on the beach, you can turn the wheels a lot more versus your actual distance that you'd move on the beach. And so as you're turning the wheels fast on a beach, for example, you might not move the same distance as if you were to be on a road. So on Mars, um, when we had an issue of the wheel not turning at all, it ended up acting like a shovel um, as we were turning the other five wheels and essentially moving the rover forward. So that, that shovel was actually digging a ditch behind the rover as we were driving. And so the kind of emergent behavior of that, uh, of, of that scenario allowed us to basically dig as we were driving. So when you look back on, on, on the certain materials that we, that we dug up, uh, we saw that, that there were certain minerals that were present that were indeed indicative of having very shallow subsurface water as we were digging. So not, not very deep um, in the surface. So uh, that was a good mistake, mistake in heavy quotes. If you will. And have any of them failed and, and crashed or not made it? Yeah, so so Bonnie had a photograph that she showed um, about an hour or so ago. Um, there were there was um, I guess the titles that were not in bold and not in blue uh, were the ones that were attempted, and I don't I don't know if that was just the United States or if it was worldwide. 
Um, but it's very difficult to get to Mars. NASA um, uh, and and the uh, the way that we do these uh, these kind of operations and missions allow us to to learn from any mistakes that we would make along the way. And this goes back to you know the 70s and 80s and and then forward. And so um, in terms of proof of concepts, you can get an idea about some of the technology, the 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 Mars helicopter, for example. And also the microphone that we have are actually good examples of trying out new things um, as proof of concepts for future um, events. So landing on Mars might might seem commonplace, but is is indeed not a um, an easy thing to do. So it just it just looks easy when when you have it on video like this. <laughs> Okay, so I have two questions in a, kind of about the life on Mars. Um, so uh, what would happen if they if you find life on Mars? It would be a happy day. Um, but so so the question is 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 indeed uh, very important. And so taking a step back from that question is, well, how do you know what that life is? what What are the questions you'd want to ask? Um, yourself in terms of making sure that that the life you're looking at is indeed from Mars and not from something that we brought with us. So um, if if you're able to to determine that that it is there and it's not something that came from us, um, that ends up opening up a new set of of a whole new set of questions in terms of a Martian ecology uh, and being able to understand um, what what the actual conditions. Um, that that life, and so are you, are you are you talking about cellular life, which is very likely in terms of, of any kind of microbial features. So, if you're able to even see that life, right? So even that means something I see fully significant because you're able to to see features um, that essentially are generated from from certain microorganisms that are that are on the microns on a very small scale. So if you're able to even see something that is indeed from life. Uh, you'd be talking about a microbial mat, for example, or something that that is indeed living and alive presently. And so we're not we're not too um, confident that the the actual surface itself is uh, is the best place to look for those features. So looking for ancient life and signs of ancient life versus life that's present right now um, uh, are questions you have to go forward with. Bonnie is holding up a looks like a stromatolite piece. Yeah, this is actually from the Green River Formation, um, which Scott's been there in Utah. And um, so, so this, this tells us, this is only about 10 million years old, I think, but this, this tells us that microbes formed mats and built these stromatolites over time. Because if the, if the grains were to just sediment in the normal, what they call angle of repose, it would be more flat. The fact that it's humped up like this in the geologic record, um, that actually uh, it is similar to modern structures that we have in Great Salt Lake. As the microbes form a mat and they grow towards the sun, they tend to um, maximum, maximize their exposure to light. And so you get these, um, these microbial mat structures. So we've been studying these in Great Salt Lake and trying to figure out what organisms are um, growing. I love these because they are microbes that cause precipitation of calcium carbonate. So it's, it's life that forms geology. So I, it's really where biology and geology comes together. And uh, this is one of the types of structural things that Perseverance could be looking for on Mars. And just as a reminder, we still have 65 people that are online with us in case you came later. Um, I'm Jamie, I um, work at Westminster College with Dr. Bonnie Baxter, who was just talking and we um, run Great Salt Lake Institute. We have Dr. Scott Pearl, he's from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and has worked on um, every Mars rover, um, right, Mar right, Scott, every Mars rover that you've been involved with? And uh, yeah. And then we have um, Professor John Armstrong. He is at the Ott Planetarium at Weber State University and teaches at Weber State. Um, we have um, a lot of um, John's students who uh, work at the Ott Planetarium also, and they have been so awesome to be answering questions. I feel so lucky to be here. Um, and I know um, 
the teachers that work with us, Krista says, thanks for your answers. My students are captivated by the process of landing. Um, can you talk about the process and figuring out how to land the Mars rover? Scott, me, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, so, uh, so the whole process itself takes uh, takes a years and years of planning. And so, this rover specifically had had a new way of landing in terms of um, just using software in in terms of real time to actually navigate where in the actual landing ellipse we would build a deposit where you had flowing uh, uh, very salty water in in this region. So, where within Jezo Crater would you land? And so being able to avoid hazards in terms of large boulders and rocks um, that might be there. Uh, you have um, you have your, your essentially landing ellipse that you land in, that's the most safe part. So we would want to essentially land in an area that's quote unquote boring, that's very flat and away from any hazards. And so uh, the way this rover did at this time was just using software, being able to make real time decisions with what the software is doing uh, to land safely. Why do, why, oh, well, I've got one about um, where did NASA get the idea that aliens were living on Mars? <laughs> so not aliens per se. So, so, so the differences between quote unquote aliens that the algae and the features that are forming on, on the very surface of the actual lake itself and, or pond or, or whatever it is, um, the, the very small kind of microscopic organisms that are, that are in, in these features, you're, the, the effect that you're seeing it um, uh, with your eyes, you're able to get an idea of, of, of the uh, large scale structures that, that life would actually form over time. So taking a step back from that, life needs of what if we find this, what if we find this, those are great, but when it comes down to biology, um, taking, taking several steps back from that and then thinking about how long it took to form those features. And so, one of the things on Mars that we're actually looking at um, in terms of ancient biosignatures, these are signatures that 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 it would have taken a significant amount of time for life to actually proceed and create. And so the preservation of those signatures is something that uh, um, we're looking at within specific minerals and rocks that have had access to water. Cool. Does anybody else have questions? I know Dr. Baxter has to leave pretty quick and um, I'm nothing else. So since Mars lost those very special conditions that we think of being important in life really taking off on earth, um, I like to say, we don't think we're gonna find giraffes on Mars because complicated life um, as we understand it took a long time to evolve from that really simple bacterial type life. So um, I think what we're looking for on Mars is in that microbial realm as, as Scott was talking about. And that's why, like there's some intelligence that went into thinking about if life could be there, what would it be like? Um, and, and so in part, it has to do with that timeline. Okay, I have, I have um, one, two, uh, one more question. What is Mars average temperature compared to Earth? And does the temperature, does the temperature change? Can humans survive in it? It's cold. I gotta come up with a number. Scott's gone. Who's got that, who's got that number? I'm, the... I'm, I was answering chat stuff. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, the temperatures on our Mars are in general cold, but um, at, there are times in the middle of summer at the equator that you can get up to uh, shirt sleeve weather. I mean, you wouldn't want to be wearing your shirt sleeves because it's uh, That's quite a lot of sunscreen. <laughs> yeah, a lot of sunscreen and and the low pressure and things like that. But it's, but there's a wide ver ver uh, variety. Someone once explained it to me that you know if you think about the uh, coldest place on earth, Antarctica, and the difference in temperature between winter and summer, those are some of the daily temperature swings on Mars. Wow. So uh, the, the extremes are, you know, you can go from, from bitter cold to pretty warm over 24 hours and 40 yeah. hours. <laughs> yeah, in terms of, I guess on average, it's, it's, it's minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit um yeah on average in 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 terms of a martian year 
Um, it can go as cold as minus 230 um, and then upwards of, of, of a seven degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but short sleeve and you want to have a spacesuit. <laughs> <laughs> a short sleeve spacesuit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, you know, thank you, John. Thank you, Bonnie and Scott for coming and well, thanks for everybody. It was awesome. Yeah, that was really just fun. So I'm so much. glad I didn't have to do that alone. That was stressful. <laughs> thanks for being with me, everybody. <laughs> we, we all got very quiet there for a while. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. And everybody, you know, follow at Planetarium at Weber State University on social media, Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster College on social media. And I bet we can still answer questions uh, later. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.